yeah viraj we will uh, discuss that but uh, after some time okay so we will start the session from 85 today okay uh, you can ask your doubts yeah okay. i mean at 85 yeah
ओके गुड इवनिंग ऑल सो लेट्स स्टार्ट टुडे सेशन या विराज यू आर आस्किंग सम डाउट्स व्हाट सर सर आई वांटेड टू आस्क अबाउट बेलवेन फोर्ड एल्गोरिथम कुड यू प्लीज एक्सप्लेन दैट एल्गोरिथम आई डिड नॉट अंडरस्टैंड दैट वेरी मच आई थिंक इन द वीक 5 ओपन सेशन दैट हैज बीन डिस्कस्ड राइट you can check the live session once yeah. see why i am saying it if you have specific doubts that is fine otherwise i cannot complete week 6 uh, today the whole things i cannot discuss right maybe we can have a separate session for that um, for like this kind of stuff if we have to discuss the whole algorithm okay okay sir okay. yeah so basically the idea of belvan ford's algorithm is uh, so Uh, 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 every edge you consider and you actually relax it relax it means basically you do that whether the distance so let's say uv is the edge so it connects from u to v so you check whether the dis current distance of v is less than the uh, distance of let's say some other node to u and the edge of uv so that thing that where you check if that condition so if that condition that that this particular checking of condition is called the relaxing procedure that is each edge you check whether the current distance value to reach the particular node let's say v node is lesser than the uh, is lesser or more whatever it is uh, than the distance to reach that node via u from another path that is that that particular if statement okay so, right so that now that's the relaxing that's also happening in dijkstra the same thing that in dijkstra you have that if condition right with the distance of u that thing yes sir yeah so that's what i'm saying so that condition that step that if statement that thing you would apply actually let's say you have a, a, a graph right you have a, a i mean a structure and then you have n nodes in there right and uh, n nodes are there so you have uh, if it is a tree then how many edges would be there inside it B why i am saying tree okay wait let me just uh, briefly say just a second so sir in essence we are taking every node and applying dijkstra to it with the no 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 no, no 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 not dijkstra the basically this step of dijkstra so you let's say for every node you check na if let's say distance of i don't remember what was the exact name of the array where the distance values were stored uh, so basically distance of v is less than distance of u plus uh, your let's say the weight matrix or adjacency list right right Uh, maybe let's say adjacency list was a list right uh, and uh, let's say it's uh, in this format hmm. so it's a 2d matrix only not list adjacency matrix as of now let's say uv and whatever maybe the format depends on the data structure so if it is or uh, sorry not lesser it should be more if this condition holds right if it is more then you would update it with distance of v equal to this thing right yes, so this particular step is what we call relaxing operation okay i mean it's not it's a con i mean widely used term right so like like in quick shot we have learned the quick shot algorithm but in quick shot algorithm that part where it is actually having the i and j two uh, uh, variables to track through the array and place the elements smaller than the pivot on its left hand side and larger than the pivot on its right hand side so that particular step in quick shot is that particular uh, part of the code in quick shot is what we call the partition algorithm so similar to that there are some conventional names given to uh, each of these parts of code or segments of code so this particular uh, i mean snippet of code is what we call the relaxing of the edges okay i mean if you see many books many places you would get this term we so, might <coughs> hello yeah 
So this is a Bellman Ford you are saying? Uh, I am coming to Bellman Ford only. So this is what we call the relaxing of the edges. Okay. Now this is yes. we apply in Dijkstra. That's fine. Now yeah. in Bellman Ford, the main idea is why do we use Bellman Ford? The what? What is the main advantage of Bellman Ford which Dijkstra does not have? So for every pair, we are able to find in Bellman Ford. No, no, it is for negative edges. Exactly. So it's fine negative, negative, negative edges. edges. Oh, yeah, so every pair that's fine. That is okay. That is the one thing. Dijkstra is anyway single source shortest path. So it is anyway telling that you are only able to do it for single source. And if you want to get all the pairs, then you have to run Dijkstra on all possible pairs of uh, basically NC2 number of times you have to run Dijkstra. But uh, Bellman Ford is doing it in all possible pairs of path. That is okay. But rather, other than that, also the main advantage of Bellman Ford is it can help you to uh, find distances. In a graph where I mean, in a network basically where even negative edges are present, but Dijkstra cannot give you the proper result. Okay, okay. Dijkstra cannot give you proper result. Now again, uh, uh, can someone just uh, confirm me that whether this part has been discussed that uh, in the previous open session that in week five that whether Bellman Ford can calculate the distance properly depending upon the negative edges. Or negative cycles are these parts covered in any open session? No, sir. Like? No, 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 sir. No, sir. no, no, sir. Was Bellman Ford covered? Mm. Bellman yeah. Ford covered, but 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 it was it was uh, discussed that this is only for the uh, no, uh, negative negative, negative negative edges and uh, no, not this, non, no. non yeah, yeah non non negative cycles. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That, that's what I'm saying. Now, why is it so? See, if you have a negative, that's that's the point. That's what I'm saying, actually. So if you have a graph in which there are negative cycles. Now, what do we mean by negative cycle? That the overall, let's say, you have a graph like this. Uh, no, graph may, graph may have negative edges, but it may not be negative cycle. Exactly. So it was, it was discussed that negative edges can be handled by the Bellman board, but negative cycle cannot be handled. Huh. May not be, may not be handed. Not exactly. may not be. Handed. Exactly, exactly, exactly. It was discussed. I think, uh, I think, but in the question, I think somewhere that like Bellman Ford, neither this nor that. But uh, I was not able to understand how it was. Uh, sorry, what what was the last word that you told? A, a question was there in the I think uh, in graded assignment perhaps. Okay. Uh, which Bellman Ford, uh, uh, which which graph can be handled by uh, neither uh, for negative cycles, which are, okay. which can be hand, which can be handled by the negative cycle. Yeah. See, uh, if there is a negative cycle, that means let's say this cycle, the I mean whatever A B C D are the weight of, let's say these cycles A B C D E and F. These are the weights, and obviously this is a cycle. Right now, my thing is, I'm saying a plus b plus c plus d. This whole value is less than zero. If this is the case, right? So that means what? If I ask you to that, let's say I, uh, this is your vertex one, and let's say I tell you that you have to somehow you have to reach. Uh, oh, sorry, cannot be right. So we have to, yeah. So somehow uh, you have to reach, let's say this vertex. Vertex, let's say four. So from one vertex to fourth vertex, you have to reach, and I and there is a negative cycle in the graph. Then I ask you, what is the shortest distance to reach from one to four? Now there is no proper answer to that because you would say, I would take this edge, okay, in this direction. Uh, there is a, a background noise from someone. Can you mute? Yeah. Uh, so from one to this 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 edge I would take, okay, and uh, from here I would go to this path, okay, and then what I would do is I would come here, but I would not go to the destination four. I would keep on taking this whole cycle again and again. I would keep on rotating over here. Why? So because a plus b plus c plus d is negative. Now if this traversing this path is a is contributing a negative value that means what every time you traverse it would be some minus alpha then again minus alpha then again minus alpha now so if i do it let's say k number of times my total value would be minus k alpha 
okay and uh, whatever is whatever uh, edge weight i had to traverse to reach this cycle that is basically f over here the f edge weight so minus k alpha plus f now if i do this k infinitely many times so basically this whole thing would boil down to negative infinity so if there is a negative cycle in a graph there is no proper answer what is the shortest distance because i would keep on using that ne negative cycle to cumulatively take my sum to negative value but That's sir uh, yeah. sorry to interrupt you but yeah. sir if we go if you have to go to 4 then why it will again uh, doesn't come matter of okay. cycle uh, It doesn't anyway. matter. What I mean is, so let's say if I even remove this and I ask you, okay, so let's 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 take this. The main point is not four. Let's say four is over here. The main point is negative cycle. Okay. Main point is you come over here and then you go here. Now four is this one. So this node you have to reach, and you got this negative cycle in the between. So now you would use this negative cycle infinitely many times to take your overall path length to negative value, negative infinity value. I mean, it, so that's the point. That's the main point. Okay, so if it is that, then we can't reach. There the, is, I mean, it, uh, if if you have a negative infinite infinity value, what? How can you even the notion of shortest distance does not come into play, right? There is no mm -hmm. possible shortest distance. Forget about any algorithm. There is no logic to the question of asking what is the shortest distance, because no. I I could go on that negative path and it would take me to negative infinity. So I can tell that's the shortest distance minus infinity. so so okay so if there is a negative weighted cycle in a graph right cycle means what a cycle such that all the edges in that cycle summation of that contributes to a negative value this condition that's the difference between cycle and edge now if yes. there is a cycle then we cannot run any algorithm because the notion of shortest distance does not apply but if there is a negative edge right so that means let's say a plus b plus c plus d is positive but let's say b is negative or let's say a is negative right something like that now in that kind of scenario when there is a negative edge but not a negative cycle in those kind of graphs dijkstra may or may not give correct answer okay please be bear uh, give attention over here if there is a negative cycle the notion of shortest path that no, does not exist fine forget about any algorithm if there is negative edge then dijkstra may or may not give you correct result okay it might give depending upon what is the position of that negative edge or it might not give so that means it di applying dijkstra on a graph with negative edge but not negative cycle is not full proof sometimes it may give proper result sometimes it may give wrong result that's for dijkstra okay but if you apply bellman ford on an on a graph with negative edge then it will always give you correct result so bellman ford always uh, gives correct result in a graph with negative edge <clears throat> and dijkstra may or may not so that means what when i am saying may or may not you can you have to always write an algorithm keeping in mind that it is generic that is it might it, it will always work on whatever graph you give so in that means what on a negative edge graph dijkstra you should not apply you may get correct result if you are lucky but you may not get so that's why you should not apply dijkstra on negative edge graph so these are the two points now if there is a negative cycle dijkstra is eliminated in the first row, first case only when there is a negative edge do not apply dijkstra so you apply bellman ford on a negative edge graph but even even if there is a negative edge cycle then what bellman ford can tell you is it will tell you that there is a negative edge cycle that's why the notion of uh, shortest path does not exist so bellman ford's greatest advantage is i mean obviously negative edge uh, it can handle negative edge graph but the main point you should you should say it in this way bellman ford algorithm can identify the presence of a negative weighted cycle in a graph and it can tell that okay there is a negative weighted cycle if there is no negative weighted cycle but a negative weighted edge for a or more than one basically not negative weighted cycle and negative weighted edges then bellman ford can also give you the proper result 
so it can do both the things it can identify the presence of a negative weighted cycle and tell you that there does not exist any path it can also find you a proper result in the absence of a negative weighted cycle but in the presence of negative weighted edges okay so that's the point now the basic idea of bellman ford is this is what i was talking so this is the relaxing operation that you check for every uh, pair of uh, edges that uh, 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 not pair of edges basically every edge you check that uh, this particular condition that you applied in dijkstra also relaxing operation so relaxing how uh, why relaxing i mean uh, it's a term called i mean this is the name uh, obviously okay. i hope these two lines should be familiar with you all guys if you have learned the dijkstra this is i mean it might be a little bit different uh, maybe i'm I, i don't know what was the name of the dictionary used and i forgot and uh, mm -hmm. let's say it might be with adjacency list but basically this step where you are checking the i mean the v is distance is lesser or more that part okay so these two lines of code is basically is basically we call the relaxing operation doesn't matter what i'm trying to say is these two lines of code we apply in bellman ford algorithm on all the vertices so bellman ford is write it in this manner Bellman. which 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 two lines we are talking about these two lines okay this one okay okay so you apply relax operation this is what we call the relax relaxation operation apply relax operation on all edges on all the edges n times n is what number of vertex now what would happen if you do it excuse me sir yeah my doubt is if let's say there are two shortest paths Yeah. Is it necessary that the Dijkstra's algorithm shortest path and the Bellman Ford's shortest path both will give the same path, or it can be different? Bellman Ford and uh, Dijkstra's shortest path. If there are multiple shortest path present, yes. Uh, is it uh, necessary that uh, the shortest path no. I uh, I get from applying Bellman Ford and the shortest path I, shortest path I get from applying Dijkstra both will be same? No, no I think no, sir. No, 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 no. doesn't matter it, it's not like that it depends on the implementation a little bit but it is not compulsorily like that okay Because you may get the question in grpa first i applied dijks at the path the solution was to find the sort uh, the the least cost of the operation and then the shortest path and by applying dijks i was getting the shortest path but it was a different path but when i applied bellman ford then it took all the test cases yeah yeah that's what i'm saying you would get the minimum value path that is correct but uh, i mean minimum value path but that yes, should the value be value was matching yeah the value yeah. was matching but the yeah. path was not matching path will not match i might not match okay, okay. might be. so because okay anyways that because we can discuss later uh the thing is uh, dijkstra and bellman ford's mainly difference is dijkstra would apply this relaxing operation vertex by vertex okay i would discuss that anyway we have to discuss that uh, later also so uh, apply relax operation on all edges n times right n is the number of vertices that's what you basically do in your bellman ford now what will happen is let's say i want to ask you this question that given a source vertex and given a destination vertex on a graph i need i need to find the shortest path that's the main question we are dealing with now on that path let's say in the graph we have n vertices what is the maximum possible number of edges that can be there on that path n minus 1 n minus 1 because any path when if i have let's say the there is no other way to reach so let's say i have a graph like this okay i have a simple straight line kind of graph and uh, these are the edges like this and i ask you this is my source this is my destination and i ask you to find the shortest path now the thing is uh, if this is the question then there is no other path uh, other than basically that's this straight linear way 
right like this other than this you cannot go so basically in this path whatever is the number of what in sorry in this graph whatever is the number of vertices that minus 1 is the number of your uh, edges on the path right shortest path so basic that the question the, the 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 fact is in a graph the maximum number of edges that can be present on a path from a source vertex to a destination vertex maximum number i'm saying please keep in mind it it might be the case that let's say there is another path like this okay and you can take this path i mean let but again that also depends let's say this is each of this is 100 let's say 200 let's say this is 30 and let's say all of these are 1 1 1 1 1 1 so obviously this path is smaller so you would take this linear path again so the main point that i'm trying to say is uh, in worst case possible the scenario can be that uh, your path the shortest path between two vertices can have the maximum number of edges equal to n minus 1 where n is the vertices why because that's the definition of a path any path is basically a tree through that graph fine so that's the concept how many of you understood it is yes it sir understood okay fine so if that's yes, the fine so if that's the thing so if a, any path can have at most at most one, n, n one one second sir this was, uh, you told about the tree please once again i could not yeah. get it so what i'm saying is in a graph in a, any arbitrary graph uh, if i give you a random source and random destination vertex the path to reach from that source to destination can yeah. have at most at most not always can have at most n minus 1 edges that's the point upper bound upper upper bound Up, upper bound upper bound upper bound okay at most n minus 1 edges yeah yeah of course yeah i got it got yeah, it got that's it. the point now if that yeah. is the case if there are maximum so give me any two vertices i would close my eye and i would tell there can be maximum n minus 1 edges that's for confirm right so if there are at most n minus 1 edges between any two vertices what i would do in bellman ford is i would apply the relax operation on all the edges n times now first iteration of bellman ford when you apply the i mean when bellman ford basically i am telling you you would apply the relax operation n times right so when you apply bellman ford first time one time right then <coughs> Every, every value in the matrix right let's say you apply bellman ford in the that uh, distance matrix you use so every value in the matrix let's say what i mean is suppose okay a b c d so after okay after first first iteration of bellman ford let's say one time you have done the relax operation out of the n times one time you have done relax operation can you tell me let's say given this is the graph what is the question sir i am asking i have not yet completed the question is uh, it's on undirected graph only i'm applying now I, my question is given this graph g okay one time you have applied bellman ford algorithm and you have this matrix of structure this adjacency matrix in which you are storing the okay. current current distances so what would be the entry of this matrix after applying bellman ford yeah one, now, now it is yes, sir this i think you were writing i think you are not able to read other people are also seeing uh, real time or lagging time real 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 or oh, some okay okay some issues with my one okay fine yeah okay. so okay. the point that i'm trying to tell is once you apply bellman ford for the first iteration that means bellman ford means this relax operation for the first iteration that one time your loop has run and you have done the relaxation relaxation means this thing oh i deleted that so anyways that that edges distance of v that thing once you do that then what would happen is let's say considering this is the graph the matrix would look like let's say a to a is anyway zero that doesn't matter a to b would be 2 uh, 
A to C, will I have any entry over here? No, sir. No. Exactly. Why? Why will I not have any entry? Because this is the first iteration. Yeah. We can reach only one vertex. Exactly. Apart. Exactly. So what does? So if that is the case, so here I will not have any entry. It would be blank. If you have initialized it with infinity, then it would be infinity. Doesn't matter. Yeah. So and let's say A D, I have an entry of seven. And B A, I would have an entry of two. Accordingly, I'm not filling it up. But the main point is, so after the first iteration of Bellman Ford, the idea is only those pairs of vertices would be connected. I mean, or or the edges only those edges would be considered that are directly connected. That is, there is only one edge between the pairs of vertices. So first iteration of Bellman Ford means one length path only in the matrix. One length path vertices would be connected. Second, one. What, excuse me. Yeah. Uh, C here is infinity, right? So you said we can't uh, go up to two edges to get to C from A. After after the first relax <clears throat> operation. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So after the, the first. First uh, iteration of Bellman Ford. Yeah. Okay. Inside that loop runs na n times in Bellman Ford. This is the first iteration of Bellman Ford. Okay. Mm -hmm. So the after the second iteration of Bellman Ford, if you ask that what would be the value of C? Let's after the second iteration, then I would say the value of C would change. Then the value of C would be the minimum distance considering two edges. Minimum distance considering two edges. So minimum, three. yeah. So it would be three. Three. Right. So every iteration of Bellman Ford means. So if I state it in this manner, uh, k iteration. Of Bellman Ford's loop means. Please mute yourself. Yeah, please. Yeah, yeah. K iteration of Bellman Ford's loop means, uh, uh, not means basically finds uh, finds pairwise. Shortest path length between vertices with strictly, not strictly. Does this make sense? Be very read this thing very carefully. There are main po points are these particular lines are very important actually. At most k, at most is very important, and uh, kth iteration of. So kth iteration of Bellman Ford's loop finds pairwise shortest path length between vertices with at most k edges. So every mm. pair of vertices. After you run the Bellman Ford loop kth time, every pair of vertices would be storing the shortest path, considering that path is of at most k edges. Let's say if you have a shorter path with k plus one or let's say k plus three number of edges, then after the kth iteration of Bellman Ford, you will not get. You would have to iterate two more times if it is let's say. Uh, I mean, or one more time. It is let's say considering k plus one edges, you have a shorter path available, right? And with so in that case, uh, if you run Bellman Ford for the one more time, uh, the loop, then it would give you that path. But unless and until so basically every kth iteration of Bellman Ford loop gives you the shorter, shortest possible path using at most k edges. So now let's come back to our previous concept. We told that given any graph. The maximum number of edges that can be present between two vertices is always n minus one. N is the number of vertices. So what that what does that mean? That means that uh, if I run my Bellman Ford algorithm for n minus one number of times, if I run my Bellman Ford for n minus one number of times, what does that mean? That means k would become n minus one. That means I would have any path. The shortest possible path, not any path. The shortest possible path, considering at most n minus one edges. 
right running bellman ford loops for n minus 1 times produces the shortest path between every pair of vertices with at most n minus 1 edges and we anyway told that any path you take between any pair of vertices it cannot be more than n minus 1 so that that what does these two statements conclude i mean infer that if i run my bellman ford loop n minus 1 times that gives me the shortest possible path in the graph between every pair of vertices right yes sir fine so why i am running it one more time i told you in bellman so ford to check for negative cycles because if we run right. it one more time then that that pair of will decrease by one more unit yeah exactly. Exactly. yes sir. if there is a negative cycle then the value will be decreasing i mean exactly that's the whole point that uh, i ran it for n minus 1 times so i got the shortest path but i would run it one more time the nth time if there is any possible negative uh, edge in the graph such that it reduces the distance if there is a negative edge and it is not reducing the distance then it doesn't matter so not negative edge negative cycle that's what i'm saying if there is a negative edge which is not reducing the overall distance then it doesn't matter okay but if there is a edge such that it is reducing the overall distance that means obviously it is a negative cycle otherwise it cannot re reduce the distance one more time hmm. right so that's the whole point that if i run it one more time and any of the distance all that i mean so let's say this is your matrix matrix of let's say after running n minus 1 times whatever some values are there okay i'm not writing so after this n minus 1 times running of bellman ford i would run one more time and if there is any change between any value in this matrix at the nth iteration of bellman ford loop any change then i would say there is a negative weighted cycle because otherwise i have taken my shortest path using n minus 1 edges and n minus 1 edges is the maximum number of edges that can be there in a path any any, any change or uh, reducing reducing any change, change means reducing reducing okay increasing anyway would not happen because you have anyway considered the i mean if you have written the code properly it would not increase because anyway we are using the relax operation and relax operation only work the condition is your distance if, if in the nth if in the nth iteration yeah the the, the value is not reducing then we are sure that there is no negative cycle uh, if Or, in the exactly exactly in yeah the, then we 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 can be sure that there is no negative cycle at all right yeah okay 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 so fine so this is the thing so that's the whole idea of bellman ford so basically if i simply write a pseudo code kind of thing for let's say i equal to 1 to n for all edges in g or let's say i run n minus 1 times over here relax shikant can you mute yeah please you we and then again you do for let's say here whatever you got the distance matrix right you store the distance matrix okay and there here you are writing i'm this is a direct pseudo code what i mean is if distance matrix the this distance matrix right after running one more time the distance matrix would be changed so at this point the distance matrix is changed so, so if this distance matrix is not equal to distance of 2 i mean where you have already copied the previous one after running for n minus 1 times then you can just print that uh, negative cycle okay or else you can just print the matrix any one of the matrix that's it so this is the overall pseudo code of bellman ford 
fine okay pseudo code okay sir okay any okay sir, i sir hello so yeah so can you explain that uh, if distance not equal to distance to uh, this is dis- are... it's a matrix i'm not that that is pseudo code so basically this is a matrix it's not variable distance matrix i mean let's say this matrix this matrix where i was storing all the pair pair wise distance mm-hmm. that's what i'm saying if uh, so i am applying for n minus 1 times right then i have to somehow check right after that i mean I, at first i'm applying n minus 1 times and whatever is the value in the distance this pair wise distance is right i store it in a separate matrix let's say we call it a distance to matrix okay and then i apply one more time and check whether there has been decrease in any one of the values so when i apply one more time the same thing relax operation obviously the distance matrix would be changed i mean suppose uh, not obviously supposing there is a negative weighted cycle so distance matrix would changed and then i would check whether this new distance matrix which i got after applying one more time whether that is equal to the previous matrix or not previous okay. means distance to which distance was storing the the previous value n minus 1 times run value okay okay hmm. that's right okay if the two value matrix are different then there is a negative cycle negative cycle yeah because it would not increase different means basically the thing is yeah, one of it will uh, decrease yeah yeah it would decrease uh. mm-hmm. okay but so why then, it will never increases because all relax operation is this thing right now here you are using this symbol it can never increase okay no sir decrease uh, no okay fine thanks okay so uh, just go through the code i mean i mean by directly seeing this pseudo code you can implement wellman code all you have to do in python at least it is very easy so don't have to think it fine so let's uh, discuss week this week's content at first sir sir yeah yeah do, do you have any method uh, to handle this negative cycle to find the minimum shortest path or minimum uh, cost of planning tree uh, any method out the, the main cost? that's what i was saying right the main idea is if you have a negative weighted cycle you can use that cycle to tell you can infinitely many times you can go through that cycle and tell okay the minimum distance from a to b is infinity minus infinity what i mean is i mean okay. i can because if you have a minus so so let's say if i ask you a given a graph with a negative cycle and ask you what is the minimum distance from a to b and there is a cycle whose overall weight is minus 2 right what you would do is you would go to that cycle let's say you have to incur uh, you have to travel three edges in order to reach that cycle whose whose overall yeah. weight is minus 2 so let's say that that three edges you traveled you uh, incurred a cost of 10 i mean total length of those three edges was 10 so fine 10 so you reach that negative weighted cycle now once you reach that negative weighted cycle you can go on rotating through that cycle infinitely many times and my 10 minus 2 minus 2 minus 2 after five times you would get, reach to zero and then you would do negative let's say i mean one crore times you do travel through that negative cycle so your overall value would be minus 2 crore and then you would simply reach to the destination and say okay my neg- i mean my answer is minus 2 crore so uh, getting the point if there is a negative weighted cycle you can bring down your overall length to negative infinity so there is no question of shortest path okay 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 there is no question means it 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 cannot be handled but in real life suppose such cases appear then how to handle it Either we can discard it then we can have the method to discard this negative cycle as is in real life can you think of a situation where uh, let's say you have a negative cycle and mm-hmm. you are asking for shortest uh, distance or any shortest and you suppose just like uh, ola travels is like that where negative edges are also used for how i think so uh, because suppose, uh, suppose you are going the way which is not permissible that's not negative maybe that's not negative that's, that's uh, okay. distance going the way not permissible is not negative because then that means see ne- you are traveling the distance my question is shortest path i am not worried about which is good which is bad i am worried about shortest distance so if you are traveling means you are covering distance the okay. only the only thing you can say in real world with respect to distance and that would be shortest is if you have a teleporter 
so at a point so that is not at, at least now we have not re reached that level of technology so, then, we, then we are why, yeah. why we are bothered about real, real if the, in the real life no negative uh, cycles can be created then why we are bothering for this it is not required at all no because in the real life it will not happen is it so yeah it would not happen but the thing is uh, while making graphs right actually okay okay ma while making graphs you you are we many times may encounter let's say negative yeah, yeah. in modeling modeling type of cases if you are modeling some problems, modeling yeah, some yeah. Huh. so yeah, let, got, got let, I, i got an idea just now so those of you who are uh, from physics uh, they would be able i mean they have learned physics they would be able to appreciate it much more so uh, in in let's say kinematics we learnt about this forces and directions right so let's say you have yeah, a yeah. so uh, frictional force which is acting always opposite to the direction of your motion so yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. so yeah so in that kind of scenario you are drawing a free body diagram and you have uh, let's say in one direction your ball is uh, falling down or let's say it's moving and you apply the trajectory of the forces to represent it in the form of a graph right and uh, so basically your uh, frictional force would always represent a negative edge because it always acts opposite yeah. to the motion so that yeah, kind yeah. of Thing can occur if you are model some that kind of. Uh, got it. I got my point. In the case of modeling, we have you should avoid negative cycles. Very simple. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so that it, it can be practical in the real life, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly. Got it. Got it. Got it. Sir. Please proceed. Okay. Uh, uh, another good example is uh, uh, this is uh, this actually is practically used. Uh, I mean, I I have been working on a particular project on that. So that is. Uh, we have these things in in chemistry when we do uh, let's say an experiment uh, there can be a transfer of heat that would happen i mean there there is always but it can be either the heat can be absorbed or it can be released so many of you yeah. are much more aware of that, that I, yeah either exothermic or endothermic exothermic like or endothermic re reaction so yeah. basically we have let's say you have a complex set of reactions going on uh, from a to b and there are by products and let's say there are i mean there is a sequence chain of reaction it. so yeah, in, in that chain of reaction you uh, many a times we have to find uh, the quasi static states or some equilibrium point and all those things are there so if you represent the chain of reaction and there is some by product creation and all of that in the form of a graph and uh, from this a compound to b compound whether this is an exothermic or endothermic reaction depending upon that and what is the amount of energy released or absorbed in that process so the amount of energy released or absorbed in that process can be your uh, weight of the edge of the graph and whether it is a positive edge and negative edge can represent whether it is an exothermic or endothermic reaction i mean whether it releases heat or gathers heat i mean it takes it takes in heat so on the and, and you can form a network of that uh, whole sequence of chemical reaction and then you can apply for many things to find proper i mean to draw insights so there can be things like that but the problem is once we do this modeling we can get this negative cycles and we have to filter them out somehow that's okay sir i got it Got it, please. Go ahead, please. Okay, so okay, so let's come to this week's content now. Krushkal uh, algorithm. Can someone tell me how we did that? So, sir, we started by selecting. Yes. And we will see the minimum edge, and I will pick it, and I will see if it is not uh, creating a cycle, then I can. Yes, sir. sir in that uh, each uh, vortex was a component and uh, uh, to uh, join two components we selected the minimum edge in the graph and uh, then we <clears throat> then we further go on and selecting the second minimum edge in the graph and uh, and choose the edge such that the a cycle is not formed and uh, all the vortices gets covered fine using, so how how will you check that cycle is not formed by component by component if uh, uh, that vortex if that edge doesn't belong to the same component uh, each vortex was given a component number uh, okay. name right yeah. yeah yeah fine so uh, we would learn about this data structure in this week which we call the union find data structure not a data structure it's rather a kind of concept so but still it's a, it's kind of a data i mean it's working like a data structure that's why we call it so 
So, as uh, you all said, the first thing, so what is main idea of Krushkal's algorithm is we have to, we would be growing, let's say these are all the vertices that we have spread across. Okay, and I would take the minimum length edges. So let's say the first minimum length edge is this one. The second one is, let's say, this one. The third one is, let's say, this one. Right. So I would take those edges and add them all the, I mean, all the ascending order, I would arrange all the edges and I would pick each edge from the front and add, I mean, join them, put them in the graph, uh, put them and join the vertices with those edges. As long as they are not forming the cycles, so like this, I'm growing my graph. Let's say this is the next one, smaller. And let's say the next smaller uh, edge is uh, something like this. Right? And the, the next smaller cell is uh, edges, let's say something like this. But again, this is forming a cycle, so I cannot add this edge. So I would uh, skip this edge and take the next available option. So I would not take this. I would take, let's say, the next available smaller edges like that, and I take that because it's not forming a cycle, and this is how my graph is growing. So how are we making Krushkal's algorithm? By uh, joining separate components. Right? So we have grown separate, separate components in the graph, and then we are joining them together one by one. But keep taking care that do not form cycle. Now, as you all said that, how can we do that? We are using this union find data structure. And uh, we have three functions defined. OK, data structure means it would only use dictionaries only. But basically, we would use these three separate functions that we will define you on a dictionary. OK, now what are these functions? The first is make union find. S is basically your dictionary. I mean, the set of uh, basically the, the, the vertices. So make union find, what does it do? Make union find, since I have each of these vertices that I have, with each of those vertices, I would have a component dictionary. Component of V. Let's say V is the vertex, right? So every vertex would have a component I mean, value, and we would put the, some, some number, right? So the some value would be there, which would represent the component. So all the vertices which is there inside us, which is connected together, would be having the same component value. So the component of this vertex would, uh, let's say this is V1, V2, all of these component would be some, uh, let's say V1. OK, all of their component is V1. It can be V2, it can be V3, depends upon how your algorithm is growing. But that's the main concept. So all of the sir, sir in this uh, if uh, all these three edges are connected, uh, so we can name any one uh, component, right? I mean, uh, either it can be v one or v two or v three because all three are connected together, and since yeah. it is a single component, so I mean, Correct. yeah, right. Correct. But but the thing is, you theoretically it you can do I mean write any one of the name. Uh, but you have to make sure that that name is uniform among all the vertices in the component. But uh, actually, when you code it up, we would see that only. When you code it up, it would anyway end up being the one which was first added. We would see why that happens. OK, simple. Because when you are first and let's say all the vertices were separate, right? Just think it in this manner. Let's say, let's say when the vertices were separate like this. OK, now the first iteration, what was the value? The value was component of let's say v3 was what v3 so this is your initialization component of v2 would v1 would be v1 component of v2 would be v2 each so this is a separate component. separate component because yeah. all of them are separate they are not connected so this step of initializing separate component value to each vertex is done by the make union find function okay make union find would uh, do that okay now, uh, just a second. You cannot see the cursor, right? Now? No, sir. OK. Not cursor is not visible, sir. Okay, why is this happening in this way? I don't know. Cursor is now visible, but 
डिस्टेंस ऑफ द कर्सर फ्रॉम द राइटिंग पोजिशन इज मच मोर तो आई थिंक some setting is there where distance is not uh, matching is it so for everyone or i mean let's say your cursor is visible sir sometimes but when it is in the screen even it is out of the screen because it is distance the distance of this at least uh, i think uh, uh, 10 cm 10 to 20 cm so let's say now i am just drawing this line yeah, so yeah now yeah, just a minute you are writing Uh, your visible uh, your position is visible but your cursor is uh, below this boundary line of the below the uh, below the okay, screen okay got the point now, got the point cursor is just now, a dot yeah, yeah now, now right above above this line where we were writing right above this line go above here no 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 oh, more 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 go go up 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 now uh, it is visible sir yeah this is the distance This is the distance. The oh. this yeah now your your cursor is visible. Okay. Got my point. This is this is this is the distance because the uh, horizontal line your cursor is moving below that and that distance is not working. But that creates problem because when you uh, you are uh, uh, writing something, but it is not match synchronizing mm-hmm. with that. Mm-hmm. It can it can be set I think in that in that uh, I think writing part. Uh, how can we you can try it. फंक्शन मैपिंग मैपिंग Okay. Anyways, if I do on monitor one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All. Sir, I think you can proceed. We will. Is it? Okay, uh, you can proceed. Yeah. Sir, yes, sir, you can proceed it. You can try it yeah. uh, later on because it is yeah. a issue Fine. problem. You will try. next time okay Fine. okay so okay so what i was saying is so this we have this separate initialization of this what is components would be done by the make union find so that's done now the next thing is the find method find method is very simple i mean only thing is it would return the component so you find this you write and we would just simply write return component of yes that's it that's your uh, that's the only thing that we would do fine okay but the main idea is this union method this union method is the thing that we would discuss so let's go to the yeah this this method are of python na this is yeah 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 this are, are yeah 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 we are making them normal methods okay so okay, okay. yeah so this uh, these are not anything separate you have to implement it i mean it's nothing okay we have to write the code for that we right? have to write the code for that exactly so now the thing is so these two are same this is only return component of i and make union find is simply set the component to i that's it the beauty is in the union method now why beauty i would discuss that so i see how we are doing is so when i am writing union of i and j so let's say go back to the previous that dotted example when i had let's say this is vertex 3 vertex 1 and let's say vertex 2 and uh, when i'm saying let's say uh, uh, c component of okay so initially make union find has made what the component i'm writing the component value with this on the top let's say component here it is v3 only so here component is v2 only here component is v1 only right so these are the component values c okay now i am writing yeah Yeah, yeah, now visible. Okay, square. lagging something lagging. Have you written v one square? Not square, square. Uh, what I'm writing is that simple c. That means okay. I want to indicate that those are the components. Square. B one, B one c, right? So. So you could use a different color if it's convenient for you. Mm-hmm. Yeah. 
Thanks. Uh, so, so yeah, it would be fine. To so these are the colors. yeah. So these are the initial suppose uh, thing that was done by the make union find operation. After that, what I do is, let's say I get the edge right. I I want to not edge. Basically, I want to let's say join V one and V two. Now, when I in with respect to Krushkal's algorithm, when I would do the joining of V one and V two, when I have to uh, when I get the edge, uh, smallest the edge, smallest edge, and that joins V1 and V2. So my first step is I would join V1 V2. So that step of joining V1 V2 that we were doing in Krushkal's algorithm, we were adding each edge, picking the smaller smaller ones. That is basically we would replace that joining, uh, I mean lines of code with this union function call. Only thing we would do is union of i comma j. Now in Krushkal's algorithm, let's say your edge was u comma v, so you would do union of u comma v. That's it. Okay, so here what would happen? Let us see that once you write union of i comma j, this i comma j would be here v1 and v2, right? This i comma j would be your v1 and v2 because that's these two are the one that I'm trying to join. So how we would do that? See, c old equal to component of i is the first line. So component of v1, component of v2. So component of v1 is anyway v1. Component of v2 is v2. Right, C new. Then what I'm writing for k in range of n. Now I have to join v1 and v2 means in this first step, both the components have only single single bit vertices, right? Vertices. But at some point when our joining, I mean, after in the middle of the algorithm, when we have reached a certain level of joining, then obviously each of the component would have more number of vertices. So when I'm joining two separate components, so let's say this is one component C1, which has some vertices, group of vertices and in the form of a graph over here, and C2, which has some other vertices like that, right? And I'm trying to join these two, one using, let's say, U comma V, right? These two vertices. When I'm trying to do that, all I have to take care is, let's say, I change the component of all of these vertices to V, right? So that I have to take care. So that's why we are using the loop. Now the thing is, do I know which vertices are there inside this component one? I mean, how can I know? The thing is, no, that sir, we don't. Know. We don't. Know. We have to iterate through the whole thing to know. Exactly. We have to iterate and check where the value of it is equal to component of old. That is your let's say v1 in this case. So I'm using that v1, whether it is v1 or no, not. How, 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 how it is? The thing is, let's say you have this c1, c2, two components are there in the middle of yeah. the iteration. And there is there are, let's say, this graph is there. And here, this graph is there. And now I am joining these two components using the vertex u, comma v like that. Right? This is how Krushkas grows. You have a tree like that. You have a, let's say, tree like that. And then you are joining, let's say, this. Right, so that's how Krushkal actually joins each of the separate separate. Yeah, component, comp component, component to component. Yeah, so let's say this is your u vertex, and let's say this is your v vertex. Right. So when you are joining, what will I do in the next step? Now this whole thing has become one single component. It's no more a two component thing. Initially, all of them were labeled u, and all of them were labeled v. Now, since I'm joining them by this edge, I have to now make all the component of both of these graphs basically as either u or v, right? Because they are now in the single component. So the mm -hmm. thing is, let's say I'm converting all the nodes in the u component to v, right? All the nodes in the u component to v and v is anyway v. So basically what I mean is after this joining of this edge, all the vertices in this whole structure would have the component value to be v. Because it's there in only one component, single component. Now, if that's the thing, but it, may, it, yeah. it, it may happen that we can uh, name uh, all the component of B can be in the U also. It may yeah. happen. Yeah, yeah, it may happen. No problem. No problem. How to decide which one will happen exactly? That, that is question for the next slide. Okay. So, okay. okay. So okay. I, I would go there, but before that, let us. You can do that in either way, but uh, there is a. Uh, there is a very subtle and very beautiful thing. We would discuss that later. So okay. anyways, as of now, just assume my question is that I can do U to V or V to U, but the problem is how can I do that? 
right how how will you do that how will you take all the vertices of u and i mean u component and make them to v how can you do that i will create another dictionary ah uh, keep exactly. the list of the uh, keys of the component exactly so that's the next step that we would do now but as of now we have no separate dictionary only thing is we have this component dictionary which stores the component of every vertex so i do not know that each considering each vertex uh, so basically not each vertex so i do not know given a component how many vertices are there in that component if i would have known that i could have directly taken the all the vertices in u component and changed them to v that is fine but i don't know which vertices are there in the u component that's why i have to okay right that's the problem so that's why i have to travel through the range of n that is i have to travel through all the vertices this is very important over here i have to travel through all the vertices in the graph this was actually not required i could have actually done it in if if let's say i had some range of uh, let's say c old right suppose c old uh, had somehow magically given me all the vertices which it was storing so i could have only done it c old times let's say n c old not c old n c old but i cannot do that because i don't have anything like that only thing is i have the component dictionary so that's why i have to travel through all the vertices which is n over here and then check if it is equal to c old if the component of each vertex if it is equal then i am changing it to c new okay that's the point now the main as uh, one of you already told the answer i think ritwik told the answer that what we can do is uh, rather than doing this whole traversal of all the vertices we can keep a separate dictionary that would store the all the vertices in a given component so we are calling that dictionary members so what would members dictionary look like members i would have one component id let's say component any component i give over here this members dictionary would give me a list of uh um, let's say list of vertices v1 v2 right v3 dot 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 which are all there in the given component so all of this belongs to given component so now i am taking a separate dictionary called members where i am storing all the elements given in uh, all the elements present in a given component so then what i can write it over here is i can replace this n and all i need to do is simply traverse through the uh, members of c old that's it so initially this function was taking how much time because you are traveling through n items right so that's why it would take me order n time but uh, when i use the members dictionary and Uh, only travel through the members of c old then it would take what order of let's say whatever is the length of c old right so length of we write it over here right the uh, initially it was taking order n when i had this thing is taking order n time but if i modify it with members of c old right and i remove this line then this would take me order of whatever is the length of your fine now the thing is what is this value i mean what is this is it order of what order of in terms of n if i ask you to write how can you tell me what is this value can it go to order of n so i think it will grow from 1 to n minus 1 n and... Yes, sir. It cannot be n because if it is already n, then no need for. Why it cannot be n? 
I mean, no, n means see, you don't have to write order of n to get n. You can always write order of n by two. That is also order of n. So my question okay. is, okay, okay. so the question is, will can it go to the? I mean, so okay. Initially, I had n vertices, so they, it took me order n time. Now I have this members of uh, members dictionary that I'm using, right? But the problem is. let's say you have a only two components are there in the graph and let's say total n vertices are there so whatever may be the distribution of the vertices it would be very large when you come, when you in any one of the component when you merge right because either let's say c1 would have many vertices or let's say c2 would have many vertices or let's say there would be an equal distribution of vertices between c1 and c2 two components when there are only two components in a graph with n vertices so the length of members of c world would anyway would be large getting what i am trying to say so on a graph with let's say 1000 vertices and only two components are there and you have to merge it you are at a level we have to merge it i mean uh, using the union function so in that case members of c world would be anyway large because it would have would would have at least let's say i mean it can have a lot of elements if i if we partition it it would be around n by 2 and that would uh, definitely give you order n time so at worst case even by using the members dictionary i can boil down myself to order n time only so there is no advantage like that okay all right so then what did we gain or is it the solution the thing is this is the solution but there is a slight difference now the question that uh, shrikant was asking that we would discuss that that the beauty is the union function does not change okay let's see i have discussed it in this slide only basically let's go to the new slide where the union function is using the members yeah so here we are using the c members c old and i i have not using the if condition because i already know that all the vertices k are basically members of c old so we would change the component of k to c new that is fine we would add the new members in the new members dictionary and this is something that we are doing this is very important right size of c new not i mean it's very simple trivial but the thing is this would actually help us size of c new equal to size of c new plus 1 that means i am increasing the i'm having a size dictionary along with the members and component dictionary where size of a given component let's say c new component size of my let's say component would give me basically the length of my, oh anyways it's written over here only i'm writing it again so size of a given component would give me the length of the members that is how many elements are there in how many nodes are there inside that component so that i am using okay fine so this is the method now we have used using the members dictionary but it's still same it can still boil down to order n we have not changed anything that's what i was arguing in the previous slide so nothing has changed because again i can boil down to the order n time so this is the same thing that i was discussing now the thing is actually although it seems order n times first first you tell me are you convinced it can go up to order n time if you are not convinced then we have to at first discuss that so Yes, sir. Can I sit and go up to right? Them? Right, because yes. C one component, C two component. Let's say I have n vertices. Let's say in C one I have n by four vertices. Let's say in C two I have three n by four vertices. Right. So what? Let's say this is your C old. I mean, and let's say this is your C new. So I ask you, what is the order of length of members of C old? so this would be what order of n by 4 what is that order of n right so it can actually boil down to order of n time but the thing is now we would see something that it looks like it is boiling i mean it's taking me down to order n time but it has a certain intricate aspect what is that see till now so this is a very defining moment uh, of our course not but very defining but the thing is we would not delve into this much deep we would just see in fact this is the only example where we would see this kind of analysis so 
remember in the week one, not week one, uh, week one is Python, in week two, that is the first week for PDSA, I mean, algorithms courses, we learned about asymptotic complexity. So what are asymptotic complexity? How do we analyze and all of that? So now we would see actually <coughs> with asymptot asymptotic complexity is one method of uh, calculating, I mean, your, your time complexity, your all this efficiency factor. So asymptotic complexity is one particular method of uh, timing your code. There can be other, not there can, there are other methods as well. And one of them is what we call the amortized analysis. Okay. First one was asymptotic analysis. This is what we call the amortized analysis. Now, what do we mean by amortized analysis? So asymptotic analysis would take, would always consider the worst possible scenario that's happening in your code. Like in this union function, we gave an example that the, anyway I'm using members C old, but at the worst possible scenario, it can boil, I mean, it can take me to order n. This is asymptotic analysis. Now, amortized analysis is a bit more realistic, uh, practical minded. So how amortized analysis works is, let's say you are doing an operation for, let's say, k number of times, k number of times, Uh, you are doing an operation by k number of times. And uh, the first time, let's say when you did it for the first time, it took you, let's say, as of now, I'm not going into asymptoting. Uh, I mean, I'm, I'm discussing with timing only. In proper timing means timing in, in seconds, in units of time, millisecond seconds. So initially, let's say the first time it took you three seconds. Then let's say it took you maybe four seconds. And then it suddenly decreases, let's say two seconds, then also two seconds. And plus, let's say again, three seconds, plus dot, 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 plus, let's say one second. Here you have total k elements. So you did the operation for k number of times. These are the time taken by your algorithm. Amortized analysis does this, that it would sum up. Let's say you are doing an operation for k times. It would consider all the time taken for k operation and divide it by k. Sir, we have done this before. When we saw that degree of a vertice, when we made that algorithm proportional to the degree of the vertice, and then we added all the degrees of the vertice. So at one well, point we were not gaining much but in the bigger larger picture we were gaining a lot no no sorry where where in which algorithm sir in week three there was one algorithm where uh sir showed that uh, we can so instead of using an adjacency uh matrix we can use a list and uh, in which in, in which the algorithm will be proportional to the degree of the vertices that is uh, uh, and then, and then we, he told that uh, in this uh, the lo smaller picture we won't gain much, but in the larger picture, uh, the eventually it will boil down to a very small degree. Okay, I have to check that out. I, I maybe sir, BFS sir might have discussed something extra or some. I mean, maybe an additional point to that. But BFS algorithm we generally can analyze it with simple asymptotic analysis, so that works. But uh, if there is something that Sir told as an extra pointer, then I'm not able to recollect it as of now. I would check that and get back. Fine. Okay. 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 But this union upper, I mean, union find you cannot analyze it with using simple asymptotic analysis. Okay. So, anyways, so uh, what is uh, what is amortized analysis? Now we are doing that. That okay. So this part that I'm discussing is nothing to do with union as of now. I would come to union later. This is normal amortized analysis. This is the idea of amortized analysis. Nice. Fine. So you do K operation. I mean, I'm sorry, the so one. What is the, what, is the exact, what is the exact meaning of this? Literal meaning of the amortized. Amortized. Uh, okay. The li English literal meaning, maybe you can check it. But the thing is, it's actually, you can consider it as ag aggregate analysis. That is, you are aggregating it. Okay. Average. Aggregation. Average. Yeah. yeah, averaging. Mm. Yeah. Averaging in a different way, averaging. not mathematical. No, yeah, exactly. Yeah. So, okay. Okay. but but the main point is one operation. I'm writing an operation. So it's not a group of operation that we are doing. 
you are doing one operation only and that operation you are repeating for let's say k times that is very very important you cannot say that okay i have separate separate operation i run the code and do the separate operation and average no 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 that's not the concept the thing is i know that some of my operations can be such that let's say when the first time you run it it may take a little bit more time but after that it may take less time some operation can be like that in 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 each iteration it is changing dynamic yeah exactly it is it is changing the time that it is taking is changing but it's the only single operation so let's say the partition let's say uh, uh, take a specific operation let's say relaxing that i discussed so this is always amortization analysis is always dealing with a single operation not the whole thing so like here we would discuss amortized using the union operation right so i would discuss only about the union operation that you do union operation for k number of times and then you analyze then you aggregate them okay because my question is that how to analyze the time complexity for union operation union function right that's my question so i am telling you asymptotic analysis is not a great tool okay why it is not a great tool once we discuss amortized it would be you would understand so i am just telling that you have to use amortized analysis so what i am trying to do is the difference between amortized and and, and and asymptotic analysis is at asymptotic analysis would take the code and it would i mean take the uh, uh, operation and consider its worst case that's your asymptotic analysis amortized analysis would take a practical approach it what it would do is that same operation it would repeat for k number I mean some number of times and then it would average them out and tell okay this is your time that's your average time this is the main primary difference okay so i do the operation and divide it by k so that's what your that's what my time is now if i do this let now let us come back to union with this idea so what i would do is i would in the slides i think we have used uh, just give me a minute m m or k what was the value m of m union okay fine <laughs> so here i am saying that we would do the union operation for m times okay i mean some km doesn't matter basically some number of times so i am use i would run the union operation m times in the process so let's say first time your vertex 1 and 2 gets joined let's say vertex 5 and 7 get joined in the second time third time let's say vertex 5 and 6 and 1 and 2 that you joined both of these two separate components are joined by let's say another vertex something like that so so let's say i do this union every union that is happening i'm repeating this lines of codes only but i have done at a certain level i have reached within this algorithm and i have done my union operation m number of times okay now what can i say there is one important factor only one thing that i am telling you is while union while doing union now this is the main point uh, when you said that uh, i mean when she can said that should i make v into u or u into v so this is that point now we are discussing while doing union make members Not me. Component. So while doing union, change members of the smaller size component. So if I have, I am joining, let's say, C old and C new. I would have to find whose size is lesser. now how can we find size remember we had this separate variable i mean separate dictionary that we started maintaining so you do this c old and if if size of c old is lesser than size of c new right so then what you would do is i would that means what that c old has lesser number of members so if c old has lesser number of members so that means if i have to change the component of all the 
nodes that are there in a i mean all the nodes that are there in one of the component obviously i want to do lesser work so one component has two nodes another component has 100 nodes who's I and mean, then you are joining these two components so that now the new component would have 102 nodes obviously you would try to change the components of the two node right let's say c1 c2 was there in uh, let's say two nodes were having component one value I mean, their component of C, uh, the vertex one and component of vertex two is both one one and there are 100 separate vertices let's say three four five six up to 103 there are some v1 v like separate 100 vertices whose component was two now we are joining them together so obviously i would change the component of those vertices which are there which are lesser in the comp i mean uh, sorry i would change the component value of those vertices which which are present in the smaller component because i have to do lesser work in that case i, I would run the loop only two times and in, if i change the component value of the 100 uh, element component then i have to run the loop for 100 times so every time i change u to v or v to u depending upon where i have to do lesser work right so for that you can use the size uh, 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 dictionary that you are using so whichever is smaller in size that one that that's member uh, though i mean that components member you would change right it's simple thing with nothing uh, a very simple idea got, got it right but the thing is how will that help how will that help in gaining an achievement in this time complexity so this is my union right lesser, I, lesser, lesser comparison will be required no? because fine so lesser comparison but i am only interested in the final expression of time complexity so even if it is lesser can i still say that still you can go up to order in time so the worst case would be when the size are same that is n by 2 fine right exactly yeah. exactly when the size... worst case. so still after doing even that also still i am not gaining at the end of the day it can go to order n yeah, auto and you will be there. Right. So that's where this is actually different. So if I ask you the question, if someone asks you in the interview or any some other other place that they tell you all of these things that you use a member's dictionary, you use the size, you merge only the smaller one into larger, all these things. And then they ask you, what is the time complexity of union operation using the asymptotic analysis? Then your answer is still order of n. But now if they ask you that why they why can you say or why are we going for amortized analysis then you can say that okay fine asymptotically worst case is order n but practically that order n would happen only once or twice but if i am doing my union operation i mean when you apply crucial you are doing union operation a lot many times right and among all those times only one time you can get union to be order n other times it would be lesser it would not be the it would not check all the vertices right because your c old would have very less number of vertices so at, only at the end when your components have grown have uh, or your components have grown that much so only at that ending point you would have a lot number of changes getting the point so initially each component would have lesser number of vertices and after that you would merge the components together and that's why your number of vertices in each component would increase obviously and just before the last joining of the edge in Krushkal, the two components would have a lot many number of vertices. And then there would be a last edge that would join them together. Okay. So only at this last level, you would have a order, kind of order and kind of time. But before that, you would not have that much time. So that's where the concept of aggregate analysis or amortized analysis comes. That it's unfair to say that because of only one or two time iteration, which might be in order and kind of uh, amount, it's unfair to tell that union operation takes order in time. So therefore, if we use this concept of if every time I would merge the smaller one into larger one, and then I would say in amortized analysis, I would repeat the union operation over k times. So k into, uh, uh, here we have used the m variable. So let me, for the consistency, use m. So I would repeat union operation m times, m into time for union that I don't know what's the time right divided by m this is my approach now the thing is first time this just keep attention on this condition when I'm saying 
I'm merging C old if lesser, so then I would only change the C old to C new. Now consider if every time I am merging the smaller uh, component into larger component. So let's say this is some smaller component C1, and there is a larger component. I mean, I'm drawing bigger circle, which reflects that there are more nodes in that component. So let's say C2. So I merge them using, let's say, their U vertex is there in C1, and V vertex is there in C2, and I merge them. Right? So my new component is now changed to, which one would I change? I would change this C1 into C2, right? Because C1 would have lesser number of vertices. So I would change this C1 into C2. This is the thing that I'm doing. Is this because C1 has less number of vertices? Exactly. Exactly. <clears throat> exactly. Now, if I just do this step that every time I merge the smaller, I mean, change the value of the smaller component, can I tell that every time the union operation is performed, the smaller component, whatever may be its size was, it is getting at least doubled? Is, is it OK to say that? Yes. Sir. Not every time, sir. Why not every time? I'm because, telling uh, See, sir, C1 has a less number of vertices. We know that. And uh, C2 has, has more number of vertices. Number. OK. My argument was every hmm. time I am merging, that is, I am using union, Yeah. the size of the overall component gets at least twice the number of smaller component, the previous smaller component. That's what I'm saying. OK, huh. oh, yeah. Oh, sorry. I'm, I'm not sorry. telling the larger component. I'm telling the smaller component. Mm. Uh, yeah. Yes, sir. Right? Uh, then it's OK. So you got a doubling factor, right? That doubling factor you got. You start from one, com well, let's say, one element component. Then you get double two element component. Then you, again, let's say you got a single element, but again, somewhere else you get. So what I mean is, doesn't matter how you do the union. If you are doing it for, let's say, k or m or let's say some arbitrary number of times, I can always guarantee that each, each of those iterations, you are actually twicing the number of the size of the component. Because twice means twice into the, the previous smaller component size every time you are doing that. That's that's OK with everyone? Is that statement fine? Right? Yes. If that is OK, then if I tell you how many times can you do this? If you are doubling which, which, huh? which one is being doubled? Component is being doubled or the vertices inside the component but, is being doubled? So log and time it will happen. Exactly, exactly. So I would come to that. Compo uh, component double name. What I mean is the size of the component, right? The vertices that you are making. So you are merging uh, see initially this was C1. Yeah. Right? Simple. Initially it was C1. And in it is C2. Now, since C1 has lesser number of vertices because it is a smaller circle, okay. So there are, let's say, only so, three vertices. Suppose, are, yeah, only three, that is 20. Yeah, let's say eight vertices are there. Fine. Okay. okay. Now, obviously, since this is a smaller component, I told you we would change these three vertices to C2. Right? We, we, we will change, yeah, you will change it. Uh, then the C2, C2 will have 11 vertices. Fine, exactly. That's what I'm saying. So now C2 is having 11 vertices. Yeah. So and what the, the name of the C2 is name of the C2 is same. We are not changing the name, no? Yeah, yeah. It's C2 only. That's the point. I'm keeping all and the. What is what is being doubled? What is being doubled? So you got C2, right? What is the size of C2 now? Eight. Now 11. 11. Now 11. After murder, C2... after murder, it is 11. I said my my initial. Uh, what is the initial size of C1? Three. Hmm. Three, right? Hmm, yeah, it's more than double. Yeah. My my statement is when you do at least the smaller twice the number of small uh, twice the size of the smaller component is the new component. That's my statement. Yeah, yeah, okay, fine. That is okay. Of course, it will be. Of course, it will be. That's that's the this this very yeah, simple yeah. observation, very obvious observation gives you. You this are you are, you are you are stressing now, so we are going into too much depth. <laughs> Above is not visible. Uh, yeah, yeah, that's what I'm simple. saying. It is very simple. That's the it point. Is very much simple. That's the thing in algorithm. So you have to observe the simple things. Now, once you get this simple observation, now you can say, if I am twicing the number of the twicing the size of components, what is the size of components? Vertices. So that means every yeah. time I am adding or merging two component, I am 
what i am doing i am incorporating the vertices which were separate which was tray i was i am incorporating them together and finally i would end up with one component and that would be the end of my algorithm so if that is the case and i am doubling it up every time how many times would you take to cover up all the vertices at worst case n minus 1 is it you are doubling it up keep that log n log n log n it would be it okay we are doubling it this time right right so it would be log n times log n times so every time we are doubling do two times we are doubling ah, two into that right exactly now one very so important ha equal to n then it, it will write there. okay yeah mm. yeah but the thing is in the penultimate merge in the pen log m is totally fine because we am doubling it up i have to take log m steps to do the merge merge operation but in the penultimate <clears throat> just in the very last level i would be merging only two component which would have many number of uh, uh, vertices and that can be in order of n but i am not worried about that because even in the one or two i mean let's say last few iteration are in order of n but still i can reach that level in only log n amount of time so if i do m continuous union operation each of log m times right and i divide it by m that's the concept of amortized analysis right i divide it by m so i cancel this because you are doing the log m operation is the time taken i mean to uh, do the merge operation right and i doing yes. m that i said that k times i told you this thing right that amortized analysis means you would do k number of yes. operation right and then divide it by k so here it's log m so i am doing m log m and then dividing it by m so m m cancels out you get a log m type so i can say the amortized analysis of your union operation is log m so this is order of log m very important is amortized yes. amortized Amort means uh, we are uh, multiplying it by uh... amortized means you are doing it you are you are telling that okay the time complexity is log m but i will not tell you log m if you do it once or twice let's say you i tell you the uh, complexity of union is log m you argue that okay it's not log m it's order of n i can show you and then i tell you okay you show then you do what you just do the union operation once or twice and then say that okay this much time is taken that i will not say that is what asymptotic analysis says so you even if you do any time one time two time worst case it cannot be my better i mean it cannot be uh, worse than order of n that's what amorti uh, uh, asymptotic analysis tells amortized analysis is telling you that okay if you only run it once i am not taking any guarantee you have to run it uh, let's say a sequence of number of let's say k times n times some number of times you have to run it and then you take the total time and divide it up and find the average time that is taken and that is in terms of log m that is log m okay okay got the idea that is the difference between amortized analysis and asymptotic analysis the same code that what i was <laughs> trying to say the same code if you tell asymptotic analysis so i would say order n and what does that mean that means you can come and you can execute this method one time and still it would not be i mean worse than order n even i mean you come any time of the day and execute it it would not be better worse than order n that's what asymptotic analysis gives mm -hmm. and okay. i am telling you it's it would be log n when you actually execute the union method not one times but a uh, some some number of times yeah, let's yeah. say okay. uh, some uh, mkm whatever some number of times you do and then you find the aggregate and aggregate. then you see what is the result that i am getting that would be in terms of log got the idea that's the okay. yeah. that's the point okay so in amortized we have to divide it to get the average uh, average um, yeah Yeah. yeah now the whole idea of why union operation i am coming into this average analysis the thing is because initial time when you are unioning you are actually having so first iteration would be what separate all the vertices would be in their separate component so basically yes. some comp component size <clears throat> would be one what so if each component size is one the first union would take only a constant amount of time only one one element would be there you merge them that's it mm -hmm. right a very less time would be taken but as but as soon as your component grows that is number of vertices in each component grows then your this loop would take more time start taking more time mm. so in initially your union operation take would less would take very little time but as you grow towards the final component right the as you as you end, goes to the end of your algorithm 
then towards the last it would take more time because now the component size would increase right mm -hmm. so because it is taking lesser time in the start and more time at the end that's why i am doing the average and telling okay that's why the average is overall long. it's long exactly. yeah. and uh, when it uh, does it the final time then we said that this is a single whole component exactly. containing number of vertices so containing the <clears throat> Single component crucial means what? When you do crucial, if you get a single component, that means your tree has already been made, mm -hmm. right? It means it means this this uh, make union find function is a function of the number of vertices. If yeah. it is more, then it will take this amortized uh, way of doing, right? Yeah, amortized. Huh? Because union operation is such an operation. If you do it for uh, let's say some number of times, in the initial number of times, it would be taking lesser time because your component size is less. So your component yeah. size less means what? Your member sealed would be very small. Only for in first case, it would be one element, and then it would start slowly, slowly. It would start growing, and then later phases, just before the end of the let's say you run union for k times. So after amount, I mean, consider the first. At least three fourth of k, it would be taking lesser time, and after that, it would take some time because your component size has itself increased. So this loop would take more time, more iterate, more number of times. So, but so, whether whether yeah, please yeah, whether this uh, uh, analysis will have uh, will reach a point where after that, suppose some some n some n is there, number ten thousand, four thousand, say ten to this or yeah. seven is like that. After that, it will stabilize and it will have a same number of time, same amount of time. Ah uh, no, uh, the thing is, see, what is your? It is not like that. No, it's no, not no. like that. That depends on the operation. Union is not like that. Why it is not like that? Just think on your own. See, you would be able to realize this. Initially, I have. That's what I'm saying. Initially, you have separate, separate vertices. So all of them are. What is the size of each component at that point? One, right? All of them have only one vertex by itself. Uh, only one, only one, only one. So, it is growing. So, what would? How many times this loop would run? In that case, in the first, only one time because members of C only would. Only one, only one. Right? Only one. What is the yeah. terminal stage of your algorithm? When you would say that all the, I mean, uh, considering you are using crucial, when you would say that your algorithm has finished, when the whole, all the vertices has come under one component, that means your tree has been made. Yeah. That, right? Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. just before that level, just before that last edge that you join, obviously that in at that level you would have components of larger size, right? Because uh, I mean, if if uh, getting the point, because last time you are joining one edge and that completes the whole thing. So whatever your component was just earlier to that, they would be very large component because all other vertices would have already been joined. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah. So, so just before, so towards that last of your algorithm, the size of the component would be very large, and during mm -hmm. that time, the time taken by union would be more because this loop would run more time. But the initial number of time, this union would take very less time. So that's why we say such kind of operation, where sometimes it is not sometimes, mainly it would happen like this only. Either in the initial times, it would take more time. Or in the later times, it would take more time. Union takes lesser time in the start and more time at the end. But wherever we do amortized analysis, actually we we think of doing amortized analysis on those algorithms which might take more time or less time at the start or at the end, right? There you cannot say that okay because only at the start it is taking more time at the end. It it we would only consider that, right? That's not we do. That's not what we do. So here that's the idea, right? So. So how did we get log m? I understood like it's doubling, but how did we get m inside the log? Ah, uh, so if you are doing doubling up, that means what you are changing the component value of these three vertices, which was c one, right? You are changing it to c two, correct? Yes. So that means what? If you are changing it to c two, and now see, now these three vertices are made from c one to it has been made to c two. Now yes. you think it in this manner again. Now, when you merge C two with something else, some other, right? And considering C two is the smaller one, and you are merging it with some other element, so all the element, I mean, all the uh, vertices which is present in C two would be changed to some C three or some other component. Yes, right? sir. Right. Now, when I change from C one to C two, what was my guarantee that the size of C one, I mean, this size of C one, let's say size of C one. Must be lesser than size of C two. 
then that's why I change from C1 to C2. Now, if that is the case, I am telling that C, therefore, if this is the case, then at this level, the size of C2 is at least twice the size of C1. Because yes. C2, right? Got so, it. so that each level, if I am doubling it up, so at this level, I would say the size of C3 is at least the size, at least twice the size of C2. Right? Yes. So yes if sir. Every time I am doubling it up, and doubling it up means I'm incorporating the vertices. And my final terminal stage is what? When all the vertices are present inside one component. So how many times would you take to reach one component, the final component, starting from n components or m components, whatever, if you are doubling it up at every level? Obviously, it's log m. Log m, yeah. Shouldn't we log n being the n components? m components, m, m. Suppose you are doing it m times, right? So log m times. But uh, ideally, the union will run for the number of edges, like like the final tree will have n um, nodes, so it will run n minus one times, right? Because yeah, yeah, I am I am assuming that I have ran union for m times, and within that m times, I have converged. That's the whole idea, right? That's that's the point. That is m m k whatever you take, that's not fixed. I would not need to run union n times every time. Because uh, see why in, why why not n times? Because I am not joining two 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 two. I am joining two components. Now each of these components would have some vertices within them. If so I would union yeah. will be run n minus one times, right? Because the tree will have n nodes, and to join the n nodes, we will have n minus one edges, and to form each of those edge, union will be run n minus one times. So no. uh, why why we need to run union n minus one times? So let's say. It is not like that because the nom nomenclature of the component component of I is equal to I is related to this because we are connected the component, not the vertices. Is it so, no, sir? Yeah, yeah, exactly. So because uh, it is the trick, but the nomenclature has been used here to connect the component. We are not bothered about the num vertices. We are uh, concerned about the component only because the the, uh, the the member inside the component is the same num name is it so uh, exactly so uh, what i mean is exactly yeah that's the point we are i am not running see you are doing union n minus 1 times that is fine but that what i am trying to say is uh, because uh, union when will you do you take each edge and i mean the smaller edge from the sorted list and then you find you call union of u comma v that's what yes. you are doing that yes, is so. fine that is fine what I'm trying to say is, if you do union for the, uh, with respect to Krushkal's algorithm, I'm not analyzing. I'm analyzing the time complexity of union operation over when you repeat it for m times. That's the point. Getting, getting now, Krushkal's algorithm analysis, we have yet not done. I would come to that, and actually, it would be equal to n log m. Uh, sir, are we going to do heaps today? Yeah, yeah, I would do that after this. Okay. Okay, okay. So the thing is, OK, as of now, whatever discussion we did, it is on the basis of the time taken by normal union operation. Forget about uh, the, there are n nodes or something. I am doing m union operation in a row to join components. And uh, my ultimate target is to form one component. right? Whatever is the number of vertices, I am not worried about that. I am doing it for m times. And how much time it would take, how, how many iterations it would take if every time I'm doubling it up. That's the concern. OK. OK, that's why I'm doing it for m times. If you do it for k times, I would say k log m divided by k, that is log k. Sorry, k log k, not k log m, sorry. k log k divided by k, which is k, log k. Fine. Then so, how this nomenclature was relevant to this the component of i is equal to i, is it, is it relevant to this? Uh, Comparison and m log m no, also. No, 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 no. It's not relevant. You can do anything. It doesn't matter. Okay, okay, okay. okay. Yeah. That's why because I was confusing with that also. No, no. Because no. the sir told us this nomenclature is the real idea about that. Okay, how it is a real idea? Component of i is equal to i because we are making naming the same i. Uh, is no, it what, relevant what, to this? what sir meant is basically when you merge them right that time the nomenclature is important that always merge the smaller into large that's that's the that yeah yeah, yeah 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 sir was telling merge yeah merging yeah, for the merging yeah, yeah, yeah. this so, is merging no? huh, this, this, this is not merging uh, this is merging this the is main merging. yeah 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 same thing this is only what what i mean is 
sir meant i mean when you do the joining the nomenclature in the sense means which one which one's component name you would change the larger one or the smaller one that is very important because that is giving you this idea of uh, doubling up thing. so we will change the nomenclature of larger one because we are incorporating smaller component into the larger right i mean nomenclature uh, means you would I mean, change yeah, the, yeah, yeah. No, the smaller one name Com of the yes component yeah component smaller. of smaller one because the component smaller means what you i mean simple there are two components one component has two element another component has 100 element you have you are merging them so you have to do lesser task so which one will you do do you want to change go through 100 element and change them to the name of the two element component or do you want to go through the two element and change them to the name of 100 element component only you could only do go through the smaller one right and change it mm -hmm. to the name of the 100 element component that's the idea okay okay, okay. Oh. right yeah yes fine so yes. now mm -hmm. yeah well, in this code where we are appending k my doubt is that shouldn't we delete after we do it like shouldn't we delete members of c old because if in the starting if ah, we have uh, okay 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 to delete it after that because it's not i'm not going to use it again and if again afterwards it comes and even with with the size also size of i shouldn't we delete that as well after the loop yes sir wouldn't that increase the space complexity of the algorithm give me a second I got the point, but what I am thinking is because, sir, any which way, if we find the two same vertices, they will be somehow in the same component. So uh, it doesn't matter if we delete from the old component. Yeah, exactly. That's what I'm thinking. Since your C old, you would not use because the existence of C old has ceased once you do exactly. the merge. So only C new would be there. So once you append it, so the appending part is important. You would have an entry corresponding to C old and all the vertices previously present in C old, but you would never use C old again. That's why it doesn't matter. Yes, sir. Yeah. But okay. uh, your space, I mean, in any way in our coding, we are not uh, releasing space and all those memory leaks and all those yeah, things. Garbage, are... garbage, garbage, garbage collector will do these things. Right? Uh, right. Later, once it gets freed, then so we are not worried about that part. Yeah, space. We are we are we are concerned about the. The time complexity time only here in this code. Yeah. The previous. Yeah. Okay. Fine. So one okay. question. One question in the beginning, sir. In the mind, I, I, yeah, I yeah. hear. So set. We are using this uh, all the vertices and component as a set because you we are storing it as a set, this, yeah. which is not hashable. No, perhaps. The, yeah. But then how how we are using these vertices in a discrete manner because set is not hashable. We cannot. Uh, in position changing, it cannot be done by the code, no? No, you. Where we are using set? I mean, in the in the uh, when we are uh, in the beginning of the lecture, this is set value well, union is working on the set well, in a uh, set uh, component. Okay, okay, set. okay, okay, okay. Not I mean set doesn't mean in that I mean data structure kind of a set. I mean set means basically where okay, you are storing. Okay, okay. That this this is question I confuse with because no, set no, no. this is not a set theory set. This no. is a set only. Okay, okay. In yeah, the number, yeah. okay, good. Right. That does not matter about the mathematical set, right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. No. Because I was thinking about that, but it was not matching anyway. So it was it is not has right? No, no, okay. No, no. okay, 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 got it. Thank you. Yeah. So uh, let us come to this part now. That we were saying the crucial algorithm thing. So see. Here we are using the n n minus one edges. Now, now that's what I'm saying. If I repeat union for m number of times, initial case that was a separate example. Now we are discussing. Uh, now we have discussed how union is working and union operation takes log m times, provided you are doing it for m number of times. That's the very important point. Okay, when I ask you that you are your, if I tell you that your graph has what number of vertices of your graph is, let's say k, right? Number of vertices in your graph is k, and let's say on that graph, I am not worried about whether the tree is formed or not. What I am telling you, on that graph, you have applied union operation, let's say m times. Applied union 
n m times and your graph has k number of vertices okay and i ask you the question what is the time that union would take what is that amortized time complexity of union then what will be your answer what what question again sir question is logan sir uh, yeah i am repeating the question logan sir just just a second yeah so your graph has k vertices and you are applying union operation on the graph m times you don't have to think about whether the tree is formed or not formed or whatever i am not worried about that only a graph k vertices are there graph means obviously only the vertices because anyway you are joining so you have k vertices in the graph on that graph you are applying the union operation m number of times m number of times then what is the time complexity of union log m log m right m. or or log k m sir m that's the log very m sir yeah so that's very important point as uh, uh, till now in asymptotic analysis we have seen that whatever is the input size so let's say an array is n length so you get uh, if you do binary search it would take you order of n because n was the input size but here the graph size can be n can be k whatever asymptotic and uh, sorry amortized analysis takes into care the number of times you are applying the operation and then aggregating it therefore you when you are finding the time complexity of union using amortized analysis the factor that would be deciding this would be the number of times that you execute the union operation it wouldn't be the number of vertices that you have if you execute the union operation n times then it would be order n the vertices is also n you do it n times order n that is fine so that's the point as uh, one of you was raising i think archit was raising that so that's why i told i am not discussing krushkal now i am discussing separately the union operation because this point is very important some of you make this mistake in exam that we give you in the one code where let's say union operation is running on an at list or or some other data structure let's say we are running union operation and that size of the data structure is let's say n square n cross n matrix is there suppose a a a adjacency matrix is there which is n square and uh, you have run union operation on that let's say m times and in the question we give you option that uh, what what is the time complexity of union operation many of you will write the answer order of log n square right or two log n basically so basically that would boil down to log n so ultimately that is log n so many one many of you write log n time but that's not correct union operation or any kind of amortized analysis kind of operation where you do amortized analysis it always depends on the number of times that you run so if i am telling you the input size is uh, on which that operation is running is n or k or whatever it doesn't matter if i am running the uh, function for m times that that would be log m or m or whatever is the time complexity it would be in terms of that variable whatever times i am running fine so keeping that concept in mind so this is log m not so, log k so we will do so how number of times you are uh, doing applying the union operation to get the single component and exactly the complexity so, will be based on that that many times exactly yeah. Okay. now comes the factor that okay i am doing it n minus for since i would have in order to make a tree how many edges would be there a tree has n minus 1 edges so if n minus 1 edges are there so i would repeat the union operation n minus 1 times to join each edge and so you, since i am doing union itself for order n time n minus 1 means order n time so then it is order n log n but be very careful to uh, point out this difference that it is n log n because here i am doing it for n minus 1 times if i have if in the same sized graph if i would have done it for m times or k times then it would be k log k fine okay so now since i am doing it for order n time it is n log n so union took this n log n time and sorting m is basically your number of edges now since you are sorting in krushkal's algorithm at first thing that you have to do is sort the edges so considering there are m edges so the time taken to sort m edges would be m log m time so and union operation is taking n log n time so your total time complexity is m plus n log n okay time complexity so that is union operation okay now priority queue this i would not discuss 
because see priority queue what is the meaning of a queue queue means we have already discussed what are queues it was yes. the, the data structure with a fifo kind of uh, execution order now what, what is the addition of this priority word in a queue so queue would always give you, you in the fifo order first in first out priority queue would give you on the basis of some priority value that you set some parameter you take and you tell me that okay these are the param this is the parameter on which i want my data to be uh, i mean i mean kept so that whenever i ask for so let's say your parameter is give me the smallest value right so every time you ask your queue to give a value to produce a value it would pop out the smallest element present in the queue right something like that but uh, that is what array would also do right so that's what array can also do right you keep a sorted array and uh, whenever i am asking for an element uh, if i am asking for the smallest element so you just push the i mean print the first element that's it if it is in ascending order so then what is the point of discussing a new data structure the thing is in priority queues what we would do is in in sorted array given a sorted array now please pay attention over here this is one of the very most important part that we would be discussing the motive of coming into the priority queue domain or having a data structure like priority queue is that i want to set priority on some parameter and i want the data to be given to me based on that priority so let's say my priority now is i want smallest elements so in a queue i store elements randomly and every time i ask the queue to give me an element it would pop out the smallest element but that's what a simple sorted array can do you take a sorted array sort it out and then every time you want a smaller element take the first element out right so then why what is priority queue we have yet not discussed but my question is why do we want to go into priority queue if my sorted array can do the same task sorting will take time okay fine i am telling you that you already have a sorted array because making a priority queue would also take time so you have a sorted array okay now hmm. what is the point of coming into a new data structure see sir right. sorting wouldn't want me to shift the all the elements by one place uh, sorry can you repeat viraj So inserting in a place wouldn't want me to shift every element by one place. So ah, exactly. Example. Yeah, nice, nice, excellent. So that's the point. Uh, the thing is, if I have a now, please again, this is one of the most important line, and many coding that you would do in the future would actually you have to take care of this. Otherwise, your code wouldn't be efficient. If you want smallest element or largest element or whatever, where you can use sorting. in a code where your data is static so what i mean is your data on which i mean so let's say you have 10 elements and you want this 10, 10 elements to be produced some code you are writing in which you want this 10 elements in the so the smallest one first and then in the next iteration the next smallest one the next smallest one like that but the thing is those 10 elements are fixed you don't have to uh, insert new element into that array right it's a static data which you has already been given to you and then you are using this data to do some task so in that kind of scenario where your uh, i mean the your data structure is not getting changed your data structure once it has been made it is fixed so in that kind of scenario you can use an array you should use an array not only you can you should use an array right but wherever you are using you need this kind of behavior of finding the smallest element or largest element or whatever but your data can also change that means it is a run time dynamic process so initially you had let's say 10 elements and after two iteration you took the first two element but now uh, again a new element has been inserted and that element obviously since you want it in the sorted order you have to place it in its proper position because you have to maintain the sorted order so when your data set on which you would be working is dynamic and it may change in the run time right in those kind of scenarios i would use priority queue why because the insertion in priority queue would take less time what is the time taken for insertion into a sorted array 
how much time would it take to insert an element in a sorted array and end in an unsorted array? So, and O of n. So that is in unsorted array, right? Sorted array. Sir. Sorted. Sorted. sorted array, sir. So unsorted array, how much time? O one. O one. Okay, and if I have to insert the element at a random position in the middle in an unsorted array, then O of n. O o of, o of n. O of n. So o of n by two. O o n. O of n n. O of n. O of n. Fine, nice. See, the thing is, those of you who said that if I have to insert, I tell you that okay, in an unsorted array, you have to put an element at arr of five. How much time will this process take? So, so one come again. One. At arr five, okay. I am not telling that you have to replace the element which is there at arr five. Arr is an array, so or a list, whatever. Okay. okay. So in that fifth index position, you have to insert some or some value. But you fifth index position insert some value means initially let's say there was ten. The value ten was there at arr five. So I don't want you to change that ten. I want you to insert a new value at arr five, and what ten would get shifted to arr six. So inside an array, it would be O one, but inside a list, it would be O n. Yes, sir, because the slicing will take time of yes, order sir. wise. So inserting and then it will basically append means like change the index of all the others. Inside the, the array, it will take the 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 one joining from the last one to the current one, and from the current one to the next one. So, if but in an array, I think in position changing is not permissible, no. So suppose I want you to let's say here it was ten, twenty, thirty. Uh, okay, I don't want it to be sorted anyway. So ninety. Uh, let's say five. Okay, let's say this is hundred. So this is suppose this is an array, unsorted array. I tell you to put a value. I mean to convert this array into this. Oh, that's my question. Now, how much time will it take to do this? O one bigger than n. Why order one? It's an O n. Order n. O n. O n. For the array, it will take O one. Why? Because because sir, it will because inside the array, it has got uh, it can easily go to that index. Fine. And the, then. Then, sir, it will basically fine. So, what are you saying is, let's say this is ARR. So, I would write ARR of two because at two position ten has to be inserted. So, ARR two equal to ten. And before doing that, I have put ARR two's value at some temporary variable to store the previous yeah, yeah. previous value. So, ten would be storing three hundred. After that, what will I have to do? Tell. Now, what will I do? So, now my array looks like this. Three hundred has been converted to ten now, and I have a temp inside temp. Three hundred is there, so you have not lost three hundred. Now, what will you do? Um, oh, sir, I did not understand the question. So, how can you make? Uh, so, you tell. I am not telling. What I mean is, this was three hundred. Now, you, how can you make it into that? So, it will directly go to that index and then change it. Fine. So, it would change three hundred to ten. Are you telling that? Yes, sir. It would directly go to see hundred twenty three hundred ninety five. Hundred twenty three hundred ninety five. That was there, right? Here it is hundred twenty three hundred ninety five. Here it is also hundred twenty and then three hundred ninety five. Ten has been inserted. So we have to push. To push, we have to push. Exactly. I am coming to that every, point. Every, every 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 element. So if I just go to the index and make this ten, then what would be my next step? How can I put the three hundred? Okay. Where will I put the three hundred? Okay, okay, okay. Now I understand. Right. See, that's the point. You have to shift it. Every element has to be shifted. So five would have to be shifted at the new location at the end. Ninety has to be shifted here. Three hundred has to be shifted here, and then you can put ten. 
and uh, we have to first find the position okay. array first, right you have to yeah you have to first find the position. Position. Hmm. so even if i give you the position even if i tell you that you have to insert at arr2 then also you would take order n time because you can go to arr2 but you cannot put it directly you have to anyway copy like this hmm. so even first if I, we will first we will shift the element or first we will uh, put the element in position Put no, no. Yes, uh, it will shift. Shift, 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 shift. Then only first there will be place. Yeah. yeah. First we will shift every, every, oh. every uh, element. After that, after that position, we have to shift plus one. Then yeah. we will put. Is it so, na? Yeah, right. yeah. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So, so you have to. And every element means what? You have reached anyway. Once you say every, that means you are considering order in time. Right? Yeah, that's why, that's why I told. That's yeah. why I told order because every value we have. Yeah. So inside the linked list, we have O1 time. Ah, inside linked list, it's O1. O1 but the O1, thing is, yeah. you can do it only O1 if I tell you the uh, pointer position. Otherwise, you again have to travel to find that node where you have to put. So that would take order. Yeah. Oh. Because, okay. Right. So, anyways, so the bottom line is given a sorted array. If you have to insert, then uh, sorry, given an unsorted array. If you have to, if I tell you simple insertion, then you can just put it at the end. That is fine. That would take you order one time because you are not putting it in the middle. But in an unsorted array, if I tell you that you have to put it in the middle at any random position, then you have to take it would take order n time. Likewise, if it is a sorted array, so obviously you would have to now think of the proper position where you have to put the element. So most of the time, it would be pushed in the middle somewhere only, depending upon the I mean, where where does that element belong in the ascending sequence? So, if you are putting it in the middle of an array, then obviously it would take order n times. So, insertion into an array, sorted array, is order n times. So, if I if your algorithm requires you to find uh, smaller smaller elements in that order to give you to supply you with smaller element from a data set, right in that sequence, and if that data set is not dynamic, that is, it is not changing then oh. use sorted array but if there might be a possibility of insertion into that data set while your algorithm is running right there might be a possibility of change in the data set while your algorithm is running then we go for priority queues because the insertion time in priority queues are lesser and insertion time in uh, emit, uh, arrays are more arrays list whatever so once we, again what are you telling what are you please once again Priority queue, the insertion, I have not discussed yet what is priority queue and all, but priority uh -huh. queues would give you, so, okay, so what is the feature that I need? So what was the thing that we needed in Krushkal? In Krushkal, you needed to find the smallest edges in that sequence, right? The smallest one, then the second smallest yeah. one, like that. Something yeah. like that in another algorithm I am writing that suppose I need the smallest, smallest values or the largest, largest values. Okay, that's my algorithm. Somewhere I'm finding, let's say, Give me the largest value, then the second largest value, then the third largest value, like that. That's my motive. Now, okay. the, now the thing is, that can be given to me by simple arrays, right? I mean, in fact, in Krushkal, we used that only. We put all the edges into an array and then sorted it out. And then we just use the, I mean, array elements. That's it. So why we are coming into priority queue with the same demand? In priority queue, our main idea would be I want the either the smallest or the largest element in a sequence. And array is also giving me the same thing. I can just maintain an array to do that. So why are we coming into priority queue? The thing is, if your data set is not changing, that is, you have a set of data and you can sort it out like in Krushkal. The edges were not changing once you find the graph. Once the graph has been given to you, your edges were fixed. Once your edges were fixed, you can sort all the edges and then use that in the array. But if I tell you in an algorithm where your edges might change, that means at the starting of the algorithm, you had, let's say, four elements in the sorted array. And then uh, in the middle of the algorithm, you again have to push some new elements into the sorted array and keep the so at array sorted because your algorithm requires that. So in those kind of scenario where your algorithm is changing the uh, required array, that is, your data set is dynamic. It is getting increased. It is getting decreased in the course of the algorithm. In those algorithms, you would need a priority queue. Why? Because the insertion time or deletion time in priority queue is lesser. 
whereas the insertion time and deletion time in array is order n fine so wherever your only motive is finding max and min uh, let's say for a array size of n you want to find n max and n min take an array and be happy with that in a algorithm where your array size might change dynamically at run time in those kind of array that dynamically at run time means what you have to do insertion that's the point so if you have to do insertion in a data structure in the course of your algorithm while still maintaining the sortedness in those algorithm you would use uh, priority queue okay why the insertion time of priority queue is lesser so you would get an advantage over there that's the point so to to you know what is priority queue here to watch the lecture once right yeah 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 so now i would discuss it uh, now only the thing is priority queue i would not discuss because see priority queue is a broader concept now whatever is there in this particular module 6.2 lecture it's a particular implementation of priority queue which you can read it up and understand it's not anything difficult or in anything particular but heap is also a priority queue and i would discuss heap today now okay so priority queue that's what i'm saying what is queue means which is giving you a stream of numbers i mean values priority queue means it is giving you a stream of value depending upon priority what is that priority it can be minimum or maximum so priority queue is basically acting its 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 feature is like a sorted array which can give you consecutively smaller or larger element depending upon it is ascending or descending but the benefit of using priority queues is that we design priority queue so that it's running i mean insertion time into the priority queue is less than order n so that if my data set is dynamic it is getting changed in the course of the algorithm right so i can use i will use priority queue so two things when i need uh, sortedness plus dynamic data set dynamic data set dynamic means the values in the data set are changing or what? values in the data set are changing yeah okay dynamic data set then use priority queue when i have only sortedness required and plus let's say static data set that is once the st algorithm starts whatever data has been given to you that's final nothing else is changing your array is not changing static data set that is then you can use sorted array like kruskal simple example actually we would discuss that in dijkstra the distance matrix was it same from the start to the end or is it getting changed sir it is getting changed in kruskal's the dist uh, distance nahi the edge matrix or whatever uh, not matrix the edge, edge list is it starting is it same at the start and at the end or will it get changed change change kruskal will it get changed what are you doing you are simply sorting the list of edges that's it it would be sorted only Okay, okay. List is not. Yes, Kruskal. It will not be changed. That's why it will be. That's that's what I'm asking, right? In Kruskal's algorithm, you have a set of edges which you sort out. Once it is sorted, then you are actually using starting the Kruskal algorithm, picking up each each edge from that. So what my question is that sorted list of edges will it change during the course of execution of no. Kruskal? No, sir. No, no, no. Consider the distance matrix in Dijkstra. Will that change during the course execution of Dijkstra? Matrix. Yes, yes. Obviously, it would change, right? That's what you do. Yes. You, relax operation is doing that. If distance of v is lesser than distance of uh, sorry, greater than distance of u plus uh, a list of v u, then you change the distance of v to the minimum. Yes. So obviously, your distance is changing. So again, you remember uh, when we did Dijkstra, we did one thing. Which which vertex do you pick the next time when you go to Dijkstra? Suppose this is these are the edges. So, so which is not being measured and has the shortest distance from the root node. Yeah, exactly. Yes, so let's sir. say let's say this is eight and let's say this is two at some point and this is one. So suppose so, I mean there are some in between there are some vertices are there. Let's right? consider that this is discontinuous. There are some vertices in between, right? And uh, all of these are lesser. At the least possible value is one distance. Suppose somehow some some other edges are also there. so obviously you would pick that vertex whose distance value is minimum you just said right so yes. i would pick this vertex 
so dist i am every time every iteration of dijkstra i am picking that vertex whose distance value is minimum to do my further iteration to do my next iteration so every iteration of dijkstra i want the minimum distance vertex right point number 1 point number 2 that same distance list i mean that distance uh, dictionary is getting changed during the course of dijkstra do you agree or not yes sir this is the exact kind of scenario where you have to use priority queue because you want to find the minimum i mean distance vertex at every iteration and again you have to basically change the value of that uh, data set or distance uh, uh, list or dictionary during the course of execution of dijkstra that's what i mean by dynamic data set that it is dynamic it is changing you have to find the minimum or maximum from that data set at every iteration and even within every iteration that data set itself is getting changed fine so in dijkstra we would use priority queue in krushkal we not don't need it because the edge list would be same it would it is not changing it's we are just referring that to pick the smallest uh, edges is the motivation clear and why because the main idea is insertion into priority queues would take less at time sorted array insertion takes order n time so any priority queue which is taking insertion of order n time that is not a priority queue i mean it's worthless so i can use a sorted array in space of that so the main idea is insertion of element into a priority queue must be lesser than order n time otherwise it's 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 i mean the motivation is lost it's of of the new data structure yes yeah, sir so why do we need priority queue is that clear or not clear sir fine so now we would come to the next part which is this priority queue heap is a special kind of priority queue right heap is a special kind of priority queue a specific kind of priority queue and you can design any priority queue all, all the only two thing that you have to keep in mind i want to either find elements in uh, smallest order or largest order basically whatever is sorted array provides you the feature then priority key is only only applicable for the dijkstra only no no any algorithm where the data set is dynamic and you have to maintain sortedness that's it sir other than heap can you give one example of priority queue other than heap there are i mean there are some examples are there but that's so i mean a fibonacci heap is also there that is a little bit different it's also heap but it has it's called heap but it is not like a heap there it's totally different right so okay. fibonacci heap is there and this is also this this particular example that sir has taken it is also a priority queue so that's why i'm not this i will not discuss this you go through it it's a, it's a custom implementation you that's what i'm saying any data structure which can provide you with a order n lesser insertion time than order n and that can provide you with sequence of minimum or sequence of maximum element that is a priority queue that is your priority you are you are finding minimum means what there is not there is not there is please once repeat again i could not get what you told last line any data structure which can give you yeah. element which can supply you element in a sorted order in a from a data set sorted order means what every time you ask that data structure to give you an element it gives you the smallest element or the largest element at that current moment in the data set right so okay okay at, that, the, at the run time at that at that time so that 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 data that feature plus the insertion time into that data structure at run time must be less than order n <laughs> right so if these two factors are satisfied that's a priority queue okay sir got it fine now, so you can implement it any manner doesn't matter now heap is a specific implementation of priority queue which we would look at so just go through this uh, slide on your own it's a particular implementation whether whether, whether, whether in the whether yeah, yeah please if i by the example you just no 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 that's what i'm down. saying I, i want to do heap at first because that's more important and more difficult okay. this okay. Okay. this okay. this this one is a custom implementation of priority queue like any i told you right if you satisfy those two feature that's a priority queue so this is a custom implementation of a priority queue right so you can check this out on your own see It, it would sir, give you sorted order, and it is also working in order root n times. Sir, right. also one more doubt. Uh, yeah. Sir, uh, are we going to learn how to code the class heap? So, like, uh, will we know? Will we make the whole class heap? 
here uh, so like sir just told what a heap is and then he told that there is impl uh, implementation of heap inside dijkstra but sir did not say anything how it will be done so no code was given about that yeah we would see the coding part i mean not not okay. in uh, we, it's there in the implementation of dijkstra we would see that over there okay right? okay. okay but before that we have to discuss the theoretical part of heap This is actually a very interesting thing. Fine. Uh, this heap is same uh, relevance uh, in the story for no. the garbage collection. No, 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 no. Okay, no. okay. okay. Thanks this a lot for what, what, I... yeah, yeah. Thanks a lot for pointing that out. This heap is a data structure with specific properties, and specific property means again, since the heap is basically a priority queue, the main two properties are giving result in sorted order, and second is it is order in lesser than order and insertion time. So those two properties it will satisfy since heap is a priority queue. In fact, in many programming languages, you would not use the term heap. You have to write priority queue to get the heap. right in i mean it inter internally inbuilt okay. things right okay so that is heap but yeah yeah but the, the heap that i discussed uh, in terms of that call stack where uh, i mean where the activation record has heap and stack as segments yeah 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 yeah, yeah, yeah. it is not like that that heap is just a i mean a, a bulk of memory it's not a data structure it's just a collection of memory mm. so even python has a import heap right Yeah, yeah. Python, Python. Python has a heap. C plus plus HTML has a priority queue. So can we use? Huh? Can we use that? Say, for example, we get some question in OPP, uh, and can we use import heap? Uh, you can use import heap. There is no problem with that. But if we ask you to, let's say, give a function and tell you to, so in heap there are multiple functions, right? Inserting into a heap, deletion from a heap, max heapifying. So if I ask you to implement that function, then obviously I have to implement it. you cannot import it but if you have any alg other algorithm let's say dijkstra algorithm in dijkstra algorithm you need heap to be implement i mean to be used so there you can use okay okay but so, don't worry we would frame the question in such a way that you would not be able to import it so <laughs> <laughs> so, so you will make a stuff in the yeah so obviously otherwise what's the point see that's why okay anyways so let's continue with this yes get late fine so at first going before going to heap what is a tree i would be moving a little bit fast now because it's a broad topic and i have to cover mm -hmm. at least heap today so so we we'll have one more session tomorrow tomorrow yeah, tomorrow is there. coding session is there right one that uh, yeah so but about the theory I, i want to know more about the heap and then the heap Uh, he put it completed today that's thing now how it is implemented in dijkstra i would see if i am not able to complete it uh, then this is week 7 right 6 so, previous week how many sessions did you guys had uh, because last week i did not take any session i had some task to do so sir actually week, week 6 i have not actually, attended any other session i have yeah it, this is first session after, after after quiz it was lagging because Time gap was very less. So week six, I think. So okay. This is first session. Okay. So last week, what this was happened? Week. What what uh, what was? Week five. Week? What week five was? Week five live coding and open session. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. So please tomorrow morning, if we are able, can we please meet once again? Because binary search tree is very complicated, and sir just was very fast with the algorithm. The so sir just showed no, no, me. No, I understand. I understand. I understand. Skimmed through the whole thing. Oh, okay. So week seven live coding is there again again. Okay, I would talk. Uh... Sir, at least some time is required for the coding and practical mm -hmm. purposes. Without understanding, we cannot code. Mm -hmm. Because without understanding a theory, we cannot code. We cannot understand. It so, takes time for understanding the theory. Also, we have to do some practical things. Otherwise, we will not be able to do that. A pen with pen and paper, we are doing this like that. So you got the point. Okay, I would see. Uh, okay, let me talk. Okay, let me talk. As of now, let's complete.
<clears throat> in okay. instead of in instead of skipping anything it is better to go slow i think so yeah yeah that's why anyways i i mean we would take one session but obviously not tomorrow morning because uh, Yeah, yes. yeah, yeah, yeah. Not task. tomorrow because we, we, you must have time for, to understand all these things again. Yeah. So uh, again, I mean, we have. I mean, other things are there, right? So we cannot do that tomorrow morning. I have to check when the time comes, and then I would be. So I would talk with Atul and confirm you guys. About it. Okay, sir. Yeah, please, 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 sir. Okay, Fine. please do the needful. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So. But sir, I'll follow up uh, tomorrow evening. Uh, I'll I'll ask again. Okay. No, I have. Again, I mean, Atul or me, my both of us have sessions tomorrow. So oh. other other sessions are there. So uh, I mean, PDS and not PDS, other things are there. So we cannot do that. Anyways, I would. Uh, we would. You would be informed. No problem. Okay. We would take. Okay. We would do okay. something about it, no issues. So, okay. Fine. So at first, before going into heat, let us discuss. Uh, okay, motivation part is clear. keep that thing in mind when you use heap i mean uh, now from now on when i would say priority queue it would mean heap when i say heap it would mean priority queue because priority queue the main concept i told there are two factors factors is sortedness element provide due element in a sorted order second is insertion in less than n time if these two things are there any implementation is called a priority queue if heap is also providing those two things that's why heap is also a priority queue now from now on i would only discuss heaps so now insertion is also required to be done in n time order of n time if it is less order of n log n time, time then it is if it is uh, less, less than, than less than, than. okay okay this then okay less if it is n square then it is not an uh, priority queue right why will you go for n square implementation you have a sorted array <laughs> no no i am no no i am not going but if it is then it is not right no 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 yeah and you don't need see the uh, i mean uh, necessity whenever you have a necessity then only you go for a new okay. data structure now i got was it, happy it. with arrays but the problem with array is if i am not inserting into the array at run time like your dijkstra's data that uh, that matrix uh, yeah. distance not data distance yeah. matrix so mm -hmm. if i am not inserting into the array at run time then array is fine it would give me sorted element in that order but if i am inserting into a sorted array it takes order n time so i want something which can give me element in the uh, sorted sequence when i want it but it can also in end your any insertion time lesser than order n because array's main point was it is not it is taking order n insertion time which is more i want something which can give me lesser insertion time right so that's why oh, okay got it got it fine so before coming into heap what is a tree a tree is basically so these are data structure so it can be any number of nodes can be there any random so basically like this this is a basically a general tree only thing is that a tree if has it if it has n vertices then it would have n minus 1 edges i mean normal graph theory you all have learned what are trees so same thing here also it's a tree now if i call what if i tell a binary tree that means a tree which has at most two children at most it can have one children as well it is a binary this is a binary tree right now this is also a binary tree if i delete this thing this is also a binary tree because the definition is at most two children <clears throat> this is a binary tree but if i draw a third child then it is not a binary tree right okay Is this a binary tree? Yeah. Is this a binary tree? Yeah. yeah. Is this yeah, a binary yeah, tree? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Anything is a binary tree, right? At most two yeah, children. Right. So fine, binary tree. Then we go for complete binary tree. When we go for complete binary tree, then we say that now compulsorily you must figure. I mean, you must at least at least two. at least two. Yeah. You should have no at not at least binary means you can have at most two and at least two. Basically, that means two. So every node would have two two elements. complete binary tree means every element would have two two children that so is this, at least two na no, sir no at least two means what you can also put three that's not a binary tree if you go put if you put a three okay, element okay, okay. that's not a okay, binary okay. not 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 less than two not less than two not <laughs> not, not more than two not less than two what does that mean two so you have to put two yeah, exactly two exactly two right Complete binary tree means exactly two. 
this is complete binary tree this is binary tree this is a tree complete binary tree means less than equal to 2 so say complete binary tree leaves don't have children so like because so if by, if we go by the definition then it would go for go on for infinity so no, like, obviously so, obviously you have to end at some time right not not that yeah <laughs> except the leaf node and the yeah except the leaf node correct that's correct children children would be less than equal to 2 here children would be 2 let me write it as internal nodes okay internal nodes children would be 2 Leaf node obviously no children, and tree has no bounds. Only thing is n minus one edges, and no cycles obviously. Obviously, if I have n minus one edges, that essentially means no cycles. <coughs> so these are the three things. Now we come into another notion which we call the almost complete binary tree. Almost. Almost. Complete. Now what is almost complete? Almost complete means only the last level I will allow you. So in binary tree, obviously the leaves were, I mean, they don't have any children. That's why they are leaf. Now almost binary tree is the last level. You may not have two two nodes. So basically this is an almost binary tree. So if I delete this, let me come to here only. So if I even delete these two, or let's say delete this one. So this is an almost binary tree, almost complete binary tree. So that means the level before the last. Right till this level. Till this level, I have to follow rules of complete binary tree. Okay. Right. In the last level, I can on I can follow rules of any binary tree. Binary tree. The binary tree means what? Less than equal to two. So it can be zero, it can be one, it can be two. So that's why this node has, let's say, one only. This has two. This has this. This node does not have any children. So last level, you can follow it, the rules of a normal binary tree. All the levels on top, you have to follow the rules of a complete binary tree. So that's what we call an almost complete binary tree. Is it clear? Yes, sir. Fine. Okay. So, Now, so could we have like the in the in the example like the first one has one child the second one has two child third one has one child first this this no do you mean yes sir if this has only one child but the next one has two and the third one has one so is yeah. that a com com almost complete binary ah uh, so that's the next point that i was coming thanks so now we would see this this is i mean the next part which you have to take keep take care of that always you can follow the rules of binary tree but you have to take care of the rules from the left hand side so that's the next point that i was coming that almost complete binary tree you can follow the rules of complete binary tree till the penultimate level and in the last level you can follow the rules of binary tree that means basically it can have either one children or two children but the point is you have to fill up from the left hand side so always from the left hand side the nodes would be filled up so you cannot have one children over here and two children over here you must shift this children to this place so you put it over here and in this node you can have one children so what i mean is here you can have one children that's not a problem but here you cannot here you cannot have one children if you have a children over here you can have so what i mean let me state it in this manner so you can have one children over here this is an almost complete binary tree yes okay this is an almost complete binary tree only one children is there no problem this is an almost complete binary tree yes but is this an almost complete binary tree no why because i have left this node and directly jump to this place i cannot jump to this place until and unless i have filled these two nodes i have to fill these two nodes and then i can jump to this one even this is not a com almost complete binary tree if i remove this then then also this is also not a almost complete binary tree so you have to fill up the nodes from the left hand side but you can have one children or two children that's not a problem but you have to keep in mind that i would fill up the nodes from the left hand side right so now tell me is this a almost complete binary tree yes sir fine 
Is this an almost complete binary tree? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Is this an almost complete binary tree? No, no, sir. Now? Yes. Sure. No, 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 no. It's not. Now it is. Is it now? Yes, sir. Yes. Is it now? No. No. Now? Yes. Yes. And so can, can we call this like before the uh, the child you just had? Can we call this a binary complete binary tree? Uh, so if you have this case, then the last child that you added, like this, if you have then. No, no, like uh, if you uh, for that note, if you have two child, two children, like this, right? No, no, uh, in the second graph that you just draw with the four nodes. Okay. And uh, like, there's this node in the in between two nodes, right? Yeah. If you, if that has like two two children, then you want to say so? You mean this? Yes, sir. Is this a complete binary tree? No, because complete binary tree means every the what is the rule? Children equal to two in all yes. the in, internal nodes, right? So you all have the, to... so the only the nodes. Uh, like the remaining okay. nodes are no okay. nodes only. No, no, no. Okay. So again, one more point. You have to fill up the levels as well. So since you have reached this level, right? So yes, you cannot say this leaf, I can hang it around. You have to also fill up this. Then also so indirectly, sir, we are saying that all the leaves should be at one at level. At the same level, at the same level, exactly. Correct. And at that level, all the leaves should be filled. Filled. Exactly. That's the definition of complete binary tree. Oh. Okay. So almost complete binary tree. So what are the points that we learned? That the last level, you can have one or two children. Before that last level, all levels must be like complete binary tree. It should be filled up. Basically, complete means it should be filled up. Only the last level, but you can. Left, 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 here we are drawing the left and right. But uh -huh. in the code, yeah. how I recognize the left one is the right one? Yeah, I would discuss. Because no problem. The... No problem. Okay. We will discuss. Okay. Okay, okay, you okay. don't see the beauty is uh, you will do something in a manner that you don't have to worry at all. I mean, it would be taken okay, care of automatically. Okay. That's what we need, sir. <laughs> uh, all you have to do is uh, uh, allocate an array, and that's it. I would discuss that. No, no. Okay, so, okay, okay, okay. Fine. Fine. So the properties of almost complete binary trees understood, right? Left to right, and last level you can have zero, uh, one or two children. Except the last level, all levels must be filled up. Done, right? So that is fine. Now, with this is the structural property. What we just discussed is the structural property. Structural property of binary tree of heap. Okay, heap. This is your almost complete binary tree. So the almost complete binary tree structural property. So heap is basically an almost complete binary tree with other logical properties. So in these nodes, I have not put any value, right? We only discuss the structure of the tree. So the structure of the tree, I mean, structure of uh, the heap is like an almost, not like, it is an almost complete binary tree. Fine. Now with that, the logical property, So what I mean is every heap is a structure, sorry, is a almost complete binary tree. But obviously, all, every almost complete binary tree is not a heap because every almost complete binary tree would not have the logical properties of heap. So what is that? So logical property of heap states, there can be two kinds of heap, okay? So there can be two kinds of heap. One can be min heap, another can be max heap. So heap is also called binary heap because, I mean, there can be multiple. I said that Fibonacci heap is another kind of heap. We would not discuss that. So, in many places, you can see the term binary heap. It's just simple heap because you now know that heap is an almost complete binary tree. Since it is an almost complete binary tree, heaps are also called binary heaps. Okay. So, they are the same thing. So, logical property of heaps is there can be two kinds of heap. First is min heap, and the second is max heap. 
Now, MinHip, what it will do is MinHip will give you minimum element at the top, at the root element. Yeah, I'm not, uh, I'm not yet come to the top and that discussion yet. So basically, it will give you minimum element at every request. I mean, in that instant of time, I mean, at that instant of time, whatever data is there within that data, whatever is the minimum element that would be provided to you by MinHip. And MaxHip would give you the maximum element. OK, and the same thing with maximum element. I'm not writing it. Again. So that's the point. Keep in mind our main focus to discuss the heap or priority queues were I want elements with the smallest element in the data set at current time or the largest element in the data set at current time. That's that's why we call it priority. I'm priority prioritizing the element with the smallest value or the largest value, which one, which one, whichever it is. So now we would discuss. So this is the logical property of heap. I mean, we have to do this now. Then how? So first of all, we know heap is a struct. Uh, I mean, it is a uh, almost complete binary tree by structure. So that we have now understood. So at first, let's draw. Uh, almost complete binary logical, tree. Uh, logical. I, I, what was the logical you are selling? Uh, no, I, I would yeah, yeah, I okay, would discuss okay, now. Okay. Okay, okay. So is this almost complete binary tree? Yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. Fine. Almost. Now I am taking a min heap. I told you there can be two kinds of heap, min heap and max heap. Now we are discussing the min heap. Min heap means every parent element would be smaller than its children element. Right, heap property says every parent element, so every parent node would be smaller than its children nodes. And I don't tell you any condition about the children or among the children. That is, among the siblings, there is there is no condition. Only condition is between parent and children. So this is a parent node. So I put this node, let's say 32. The value is in 32. Min heap says. Whatever is the value inside the parent, that should be smaller. That's why we call it min heap. As one of you said, that in min heap, we put the smallest element at the top. So since this is slide, the slide, 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 you are writing something? Slide above. Uh, no, you I'm writing. writing it. Is it okay. visible to everyone or not? Uh, Actually, your slide is, you know, it, your slide is uh, lower. Please yeah, scroll up, sir. I'm at the top only. I can't scroll down. Yeah, 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 yeah. No, no, yeah. Okay, 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 please. Yeah. Visible, okay. it is visible. Screen is visible, but you are okay. writing. Okay, okay, fine. So let's say I put 32 at the root node, top node. So I mean, it says any children would be smaller. So parent node, parent value must be smaller than child value. That's the property of min heap. So I can put over here what? 82 I can put let's say any number 46 I can put but here I can put can I put here 12 no sir. no no no, no sir. it is it, it is smaller can I put we have here, to change okay so uh, can I put here let's say uh, 39 no sir no sir no 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 not less than 82. Exactly. So you have to take care of that. That's the only property. So done. So let's say 100. Let's say here I put uh, 70. No, sorry. Let's say 170. It is 46. Now, let's say here I again have a node. In this node, let's say I put 2000. Is it a so this is a min heap or not? Yes, yes. Sir, it is. Min heap. That's it. So that's the only property. Min heap is that max heap is just the opposite. So every parent would have larger value. That's it. So min heap, max heap, and there is no relation between the siblings. Okay. So siblings, I'm not telling but any yeah, relation. Yeah, we can change it because we can put any value left or right in place of 170. We can write 100 and 100 in place of 170. Anything, anything. Like so? Anything, anything. Okay. Okay. Only, no this, is the, yeah. this is the only condition. Okay, left right condition is not required here. No. Only. Yeah. Okay, okay. Fine. 
Fine. So in heaps, the only condition is in mean heap parent must be lesser than child. In max heap, parent must be larger than both the child. That's the condition of mean heap or max heap. Fine. And that's the logical. So this condition of parent being larger or smaller than child is the logical property of a heap. And structural property of a heap is it is an almost complete binary tree. Fine. Yes. Okay. Mm. Now yeah. the thing is, so why? So this structure that we just discussed, parent must be larger than child, and all these things. How will this help us? Because again, our main motivation was give me the smallest element or the largest element. For our discussion sake, I would always take the example of smallest element. Okay, that is where we would take example of min heap. But the same thing is just the opposite in max heap. So same thing applies. So I want the smallest element, the priority queue. Heap is a priority queue, so I want the smallest element. And I want an insertion in less than n time. So that's the main motivation I had. And now, how can I achieve this by using this structure? So this is the heap that's done. This is the structural property, logical property. Both these things are done, right? Now we will go into the methods of heap. That how will I find the element and all those things? We would discuss that. But before that, the question that uh, you all said that how can we ensure that uh, the insertion of element from left to right would happen? And how can we ensure all of that? The structural property. And I told that it is very easy. You don't have to ensure anything. All you have to do is allocate an array. So this is what you have to do in order to represent it in code. This structure. This is an almost complete binary tree, right? So it, we have took care of that. So it is from filling field up from left hand side, right? All of that part. And again, we have also took care of the fact that every children node must be larger than the parent node. So these two logical and structural property we have took care. But all you have to do in order to represent it in code is simply write it level by level. 32, 82, 46, 100, 170, 2000. That's it. All done. Both your almost complete binary tree property is also taken care of and your logical property is also taken care of. Now how? How you did that? So what did we do? We just simply level by level, we wrote all the elements. Nothing else. So yeah, yeah. Now, this is the thing. Left child This is index 0, this is 1, this is 2, this is 3, this is 4, this is 5. Right? Root is the index of consider. So put put this index value in root and left child and see in the array. Check on your own. What? They yes, don't get it. Left child. What is the consider? This is a... 46 is the parent node, right? So root, okay, not root. Why did I write root? Sorry. What I mean is parent. Yeah, that's a, I'm not a parent. Sorry, sorry. Root is, root is only one, huh? yeah, parent. Yeah. Now, just take any node and apply and check. Whether it is holding so uh, number of parents on the, uh, in that level. Nothing you have to do. Just simply see. 46 is the parent of 2000. Right? So put 46. 46 as position is 2. So put parent 2 yeah. index. What is this? 5. So left child of two, 46 must be uh, the five fifth position value. 2000 is the left child of 46. Okay. Is a positional value we are finding here, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Positional value, left Charlie. That's what. I, that's why I wrote this 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, right? This is the index position in the array. That's it. 0, 1, 2, okay. 3, 4, 5. That's why these are the index position in the array. All you are doing is simply putting the elements in the heap in level by level order in the array. That's it. I mean, this is this is your mental representation, right? This is your mental representation, mental image. Yeah, we are. Yeah, yeah. We are we are this maintaining the left and right child also, right? Yeah, but the beauty left, is left is one. Uh, left yeah, is one, the right is two. 
yeah 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 but you don't have to do anything else it is so easy that you simply put the element one after the other and your left child equation is this right child equation is this and that's it i mean you get all the values see you don't have to this whole structure this whole structure of your heap is taken care of by these two simple statements hmm hmm check it sir out. who founded this heap who founded this heap that's a good question <laughs> i also don't know <laughs> so so see it's it's holding right check check be be sure about it take any node let's say 32 0 right so put the value parent is 0 what would happen 0 means it is 1 is the left child and when the position 1 index position 1 value is left child and index position 2 value is the right child so what is index position 1 value 82 And what is index position two value forty six? So eighty six, eighty two is left child, forty six is right child. Go to the tree and validate. Eighty two is left child, forty six. Sir, go, sir, go one level again, one level below also, up to six, seven, eight, nine. It would hold, doesn't matter. Okay, so. Because only we are checking two levels, you know, because in this. Fine, fine. Uh, uh, proof at least three steps should be checked then. Yeah, one, two, three, two, three, just six, six, two, two three, four. Yeah, 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 yeah. It is working right. Fine. I'm not writing it. Actually, it's self. It, yeah, yeah. It is self. It is self acclaimed. Very simple is that. One, one is just adding yeah. that. Yeah. So this would. That's why. Is, why? Why do you think this property is so nicely holding? The thing is. This is only holding because heap by structurally it is an almost complete binary tree. So you get this two factor up to that level. That's why it is every time work, right? So anyways, so representation of heap in programming is as simple as just an array. Just you have to in order to pick the left and right child, you have to use these two lines of code. That's it. Sir, right? I have noticed one thing. Yeah. Sir, whatever we are able to do with a heap, we are able to. means like whatever we are able to do with a binary tree we can have three edges as children and do the same thing but you can have three three children and do the same thing so it wouldn't matter if there are two children we can do the same thing with three children also you can do that there yes, is not a problem we can do that that binary but we are discussing binary heap now if you have three children then there would be some changes in the code that you have to do Right, you can do that. It's not a problem. But binary more, is more than two, more than two children. I think obviously it may not you work. can understand this would be changed. No, it would work. The thing is, you have to take care of all the things. Like yes, sir, left child, middle child, and right child. So we do that by uh, like three into parent plus one. Plus three two plus three. Plus two plus three. Yeah. So you can do that to pick the left, middle, and right child. No problem yes, with sir. that. But you have not yet come to the insertion, deletion, heapify, maxify, all those build heap, all those code extract min, so all those things I have not yet discussed. So in all of those functions, we have to make changes accordingly. You can yeah, 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 yeah. algorithms. You can do anything. So I have something. Mean, the main thing is idea. The implementation is anything you can do. Doesn't matter, right? Two, yeah. Two oh. is two is the lovely child for computer. So yeah, we can. Yeah. Well, it's a general convention. Actually, in Fibonacci heap, you don't have any fixed one, two, three. Also, it's random. So you can do it anyway. So, anyways, I'm not getting into that. It's a fairly complex data structure, Fibonacci heap. So, do people study that in third year of CS? No, no, none of the year in CS. If you do masters in analysis, I mean, specifically in analysis domain, then you would learn. Right. Yeah, sir. This is a good question. Whether whether these things are taught, uh, not not in the CS. See, Fibonacci heap, red black tree. These things are may not mostly. It's not required in that respect. If you are doing, if you are no, doing no, this programming, 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 data structure, all these things. What we are learning. Yeah. Whether it is being taught in the computer courses also CS. Ah, uh -huh, yeah, correct. That's 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 been taught. It's been taught. It's okay. been taught. It's been taught. All of these things okay. are taught. Yeah. Okay. So is our syllabus more skewed than CS students, or is it That's as good as? Uh, I I would say, uh, yeah. So okay. 
no, no, it is totally different. It is totally different. That is a, a structural part of the computer architecture also. And here we are not learning architecture. I think. Oh, so, you are comparing it with the whole CS B Tech thing. Uh, ஒர்க்ஸ் because we are not going to work we are we are going to take work from the people no 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 it's uh, so <laughs> I mean, actually my i am also like uh, doing bsc in mathematics fine so so currently i was trying to study how we can find isomorphisms of graphs using abstract algebra and this this data structures that we are studying here okay so so mm-hmm. so like i was looking like is there to cs students get more of all this and would they, would they know how isomorphism of graphs are done or or like uh, that's a subjective question i want to discuss it but not now okay so let's do this thing first and then i would discuss okay, it okay, okay 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 sir let so, us complete it then uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Fine. so yeah, yeah, please yeah, yeah. so so this is done so uh, basically heap now uh, representation of heap is also done so structural property heap logical property of heap representation of heap right as an array these two these three things are done now the next part is how to create a heap right you i mean as of now we just filled it up in the tree structure but if i give you we know that the heap is represented in computer in the form of an array now if it is an array then how if given an array how can i make it into a heap because our representation of heap is in the form of an array right so this is a question given to you okay uh, let's say some random numbers give some random un- unsorted unsequenced numbers um 10 21 9 30 15 and 3 another 3 fine 1 2 3 4 5 6 7 give a few more ஒன்ஸ்டேட்டிங்ஸ்டேட்டிங் at first since remember we put the heap in the level order right so again it's the same thing we would do level order means what this should be the structure of the heap i don't know whether it's a heap or not but this should be the structure since it's we write in level order we would do the reverse process in level only so 21 and red 13 3 17 15 19 whatever i am discussing now it is very very important with respect to the coding part of heap so if you understand these steps you would understand how to code it up i would discuss the pseudo code anyway 71 fine did yes. i mean okay nice so now is this a okay my motive is i have to make it into a min heap hmm fine so is it a min heap no sir no not a min heap fine so how to make it into a min heap so that's the next question so first thing is we would use a build heap method i don't think these are there in the slide what you need to know the things because you have to implement heap if you have to so build sir, heap there was one slide which is called, which was called heapify mm, yeah we would come to that that i would discuss anyways okay okay so first would be my build heap method now i am not writing so let's say here you pass the heap arr so this is let's say arr okay i am not writing the parameters and all right so whatever is required the main thing is 
how would we do the making it into the heap process how will we start it so we would use two main things first is heapify algorithm that you are telling and the build heap method now what would build heap do before coming to that we need to understand the heapify part so what is heapify doing i should write the heapify over here this is your heapify fine now how does heapify algorithm works let's say you pass the array and some other whatever required elements are there okay no not required here have to write it otherwise you get confused just a second so let's say we pass an array this array is basically this error in the heapify algorithm and then we pass a root node we would pass a root node but the root node means here we would pass let's say the index of the root node fine the index of the root node and uh, let's say i have a size equal to length of my error that i put into size fine so this, this is a pseudo code that i'm writing obviously so heapify error root uh, the root means what this is root means the index basically okay not the root element this is the index of current root uh, or again i shouldn't use the root word current parent fine so heapify algorithm would basically index of the current parent so it would accept the array and it would accept the index of your current parent now why current parent we would you would understand once we discuss it see what does heapify algorithm do as of now forget about the making the heap process i would come to that later just let's take a sub part of this heap a smaller sub part let's take this part is this itself a max heap i oh, sorry min heap or not no sir no it's not a min heap right so we would discuss this heapify algorithm whatever it is doing on this sub part okay assume that this is the uh, i mean this is a separate heap uh, sorry separate array which has been given to you 10 900 70 19 71 81 now you have to make it into a heap heapify algorithm would actually given i mean if you run heapify algorithm on a parent then it would ensure that whatever is below that parent the subtree left and right subtree below that parent node is converted into a heap again i am repeating heapify algorithm it is accepting in the array and the parent node so it would once you call heapify and it gets it, it completes its execution it would ensure whatever is below that parent whatever elements are below that parent they are converted into a heap so once i call this heapify algorithm on 10 right because 10 is the parent node here i mean the primary parent the main parent so at first i would call i mean i would uh, not 10 this would be the basically index of 10 now assume that obviously index of 10 let me write it okay so this is 0 because i am considering it a separate tree 0 1 2 3 4 5 6 fine these are the indices and uh, so this would not be 10 this would be 0 now i 0 i as much as i recall these codes are not there in the slide no sir these yeah. are not so pay attention okay uh, so this is 0 is the first position again this is the index of the parent it's not 10 it's the index of the current parent Fine. Okay. Now, what we would do in order to make it a heap, just take this uh, black uh, marked subtree and tell me that what is the first step that comes to your mind in order to make it into a minimum heap? We will exchange ten and nine. I will exchange ten and nine. Uh, so, how can we do it? Some in, you have to think it in both ways, right? So, uh, my since I'm writing the code, what should I write now? 
because uh, let's say nine, uh, nine could have also been my right child and hundred could be my left child. In him, we do not worry about siblings. So what should I do basically? So, so you'll so, find the left and the right child and find the minimum of those exactly, and then compare it with the parent node. And if they are, um, the child is smaller, then just swap the two. Nice. So how can I get my left and right child first? Because this is an array. Uh, yes, two. as you told, two into the index, so two into the parent index plus one is the left child, and plus two is the right child. Exactly. So let me just write it in anyway. Ten nine hundred seventy nineteen seventy one eighty one. So this is just think that this is my array. Fine. So at first, what we would do is. My left child, let's say left child L is equal to two into parent plus one, and right child would be equal to two into parent plus two. So I got my left and right child. Next thing is I have to check which one is the largest. Uh, sorry, which one is the smallest among them? So I would check the. Let's say I have defined the smallest variable. And in that, I am checking which one is the smallest. I am writing a pseudo code. Just as you uh, left child, I pass R child, I pass, and obviously the parent itself. So, oh, uh, sorry, ten minutes. A R R of L. A R R of R. And suppose your ARR of parent. The above line also should be like that. ARR of L, two into parent in the code. No, no, no. I am writing pseudo code, right? This you can do. All you are doing is finding the smallest oh, okay. between these oh, three okay. elements. Okay. Maybe. Pseudo code. Also, pseudo code. Sir, here also we have requirement that two elements cannot be same. Sorry, index. So, like, uh, like ten cannot occur twice inside a heap. No, no, it can occur. So you can write it with less than equal to or greater than equal to. You can do it. Doesn't matter. Okay. okay. So, yes. so if I tell you that here you would had ten instead of nine, that is also a heap. So the condition considers less than equal to or greater than equal to. Oh, okay, okay, fine. Fine. So, so it is done. So index of smallest. Take care of this thing. I am taking the index of the smallest among these three, whichever it is. Now. So what we would do? What happens in the case? Let's say my the root the parent element was itself smallest. So in that case, I would not need to do any swapping, right? Any change. So I have to also take care of that because that might also happen. In fact, let's say what would happen when I am in this level? Suppose this was my heap. So obviously the root element is the parent element is the smallest one, right? So it is anyway. I don't need to make any exchanges, any swap. So What should I write now? Because I have to take care of that as well. So, sir, inside L, the heap file, you will have to equal. call the heap file. Yeah, but okay. If. So, what I mean is, I would have to put an if condition if my if. index of smallest L. is not equal to. What should I write here? Okay, wait. Let me write. Not equal to parent. parent. Yeah. If it is not parent, then only I will do the swap, right? If it is parent, I need not do anything. It's anyway a heap. Yes. Right? Sir. It is. Yeah. If if it is not parent. Yeah. If it is not a parent, then what I would do is, I would take the swap. Basically, swap. A R R of parent and parent and what? Uh, A R R of index of smallest. Exactly. L. Index of L. smallest. Fine. So now my swapping is done. And if it is anyway, I mean, if it is the else case, I need not do anything because that means what? It is. It is already heaped. Taken care of exactly. But uh, is it done? So let's apply yes. the same thing on ten and let us see what happens. So ten, nine, and hundred. I find the in this line. i find the smallest among them which is 9 so i swap uh, 9 and 10 so okay done but sir what if in place of 19 there was 7 no 
I would come to that just a second. So nine goes here, ten comes here. Uh, after this, that's it. My algorithm has finished. Yes. Is it a heap? No, no, so now it is. No, this is it is 100 and then 71 81 what happens to oh, this yes. part exactly so okay. if you take 71 and exchange it with 100 how would you know where i would have to go only thing is you had the parent starting from the 0th index after after everything you will call the heapify for the left child and right child index okay what i would do can you repeat again so like we have made the swap after everything, what we can do is we can call heapify again for um, the in like we can call it for ARR and then for L and again for ARR R. A recursion, a recursion type of thing is that. I have to they use have recursion, to... but there is a catch in that. Uh, the thing is, see, if you call heapify both times, it's a problem. I would come to the problem why it's a problem. One very important point, just you see the problem now right that i can i mean this this another subtree the right subtree is not a heap right yes yeah so so if i add a constraint that if i add a constraint that i would apply my heapify from the bottom up from the bottom yeah, yeah, to yeah. top if i apply that bottom. Right? i if thought I, that yeah bottom up if you apply my heapify from the bottom towards the top, actually, let us even delete this case. I even don't need this particular example now. I can discuss with this only. So my question is, if we apply my heapify algorithm from bottom to top, so yes. this part would be made into heap at first. This part would be made into a heap at first. And then again, yes. this whole part would be made into another heap at first. So that, that ensures the whole thing, right? Yes. So when I come to this outer part, I would be confirmed that the lower parts are anyway heap. So if the lower part is anyway heap, then this condition would never occur that this is not a heap. I mean, mean heap, I mean. This is not a mean heap now. But this would never happen if I would have applied my heapify starting from the bottom to the top, towards to the top of the tree. Yes. Getting the point? So let us do that. Now, how can we take care of that? This is where your build heap algorithm comes into action. Which what algorithm? Happened? This build heap. The build heap. Hmm. It is simple, but not simple. Uh, that's what PBS is about. It's simple, but not simple. So, <laughs> so uh, let's now discuss this build if algorithm. What it is doing is simply, I, we, you got the intuition that I must do it from the bottom, right? Now, applying heapify on 7, uh, sorry, applying. So you got the essence. My now motive is I want to apply heapify, but from the bottom. So build if would do the same thing. It would apply heapify from bottom. So somewhere build if would call heapify. That's it. But with what it would call, let's say error, so it would be there. And there would be some parameter over here. And there would be some lines of code over here that I have to write. And what, what these lines of code would ensure? Application of heapify bottom up. Can anyone, anyone suggest what lines should be there? So, sir, it will start with calling the parents of the leaf. Do I need to apply heapify? Build heap would anyway call heapify on nodes from the bottom. So, do I need to call on the leaf nodes? That's my first question. Build heap is a method and heapify is also a method. Also a method. I... Build heap is okay. calling heapify method on the nodes on the in the tree basically from bottom to top and we just saw why we need to call from bottom to top right so yeah. my question is from bottom to top if i'm applying heapify do i need to call heapify on the leaf nodes no no no, no. i'm, I'm no, no, telling no. that we can start no, no. with the 
we can start by calling the parents of the leaf node exactly apply so, hp5 to them exactly so how how can we do that so we need to call hp5 on the first parent of the leaf node so basically first parent means from the back side so 81 is a leaf 71 is a leaf 19 is a leaf 70 is a leaf 100 is the first node which is not a leaf right so, so how minus uh, minus 2 where slash slash 2 so sir said that if we can go from the 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 parent to the child by 2 uh, 2 into parent plus 1 then we can go back by 6 minus 2 mod mod 2 6 minus 1 mod 2 uh, 6 minus 1 apps um, divide divide by 2 but how would you know it is 6 or 7 or 8 now you can see the graph you size, know array. The array size okay then array size the after that um, array size array minus, minus two slash slash two. It exactly. should be minus one. Minus, minus one. one. Array size minus okay, one. Minus, okay, but why minus minus one? So uh, basically, it would be your suppose your array whatever size is there. You can just let's say uh, root basically. So number of, number of edges will be minus one. Right? First root. Let's say root. A period. You can write it as let's say size by two minus one. Check this out. So yeah, correct. Size by two minus one. If I do and store it into p, whatever it is, or let's say we even can run a loop. Doesn't matter. So let's do it in this way. I put a for loop. Okay, for let's say i equal to size by 2 minus 1 okay so and size by 2 minus 1 will not work for example if the heap did not have the sixth element it if it was just 5 5 yes for 5 it will give 1 as the parent okay let us check that so if i, I as of now how many elements i have obviously i have seven elements right so yes. seven element 7 by 2 is 3.5 minus 3 minus 2 uh, minus one that is two to so zero one two so it's working okay now if i would have five elements uh, sorry up to five that means i would have had six elements so six by two is three minus one is two five. correct i i confuse between index and size correct yeah so it's working so i can start it from so why is this two factor coming so can i say that in a heap uh I know we have not yet reached trees, but the thing is, if a tree is almost complete or a complete, then the number of internal nodes is equal to the number of leaf nodes. Okay, we would discuss that when we come to tree. In a tree, if it is a nearly complete or a complete tree, nearly complete means almost complete. So heap is an almost complete tree. So yes. if it is an almost complete tree or nearly complete or a complete tree, then the number of nodes in the leaf, that is the leaf nodes is equal to the number of all the internal nodes. So if you have a tree like this, right? And let's say there are some levels, maybe whatever, many levels. After some many levels, you reach the leaf nodes like this. OK. So whatever the, the number of nodes in this level will be actually equal to the total number of nodes in these all levels. Uh, so, so I think there would be a difference of one because like the internal nodes are odd. Uh -huh, yeah, yeah. The, the, it is actually minus one. Correct. So I would discuss all those things. It's just a notion that it's actually quite similar. It's actually lesser than one. That's correct. It would be one less. So, but it is, I mean, nearly that. That's the main idea that I want to discuss over here is since you're doubling it up every time. Which one, which one will less? Upper, upper internal yeah, nodes. Internal nodes. Okay. okay, one less. But uh, okay, that we would discuss the properties and we would derive why it is one less and all those things are there. Don't okay. worry. But the main idea okay. is the point that you should appreciate is that uh, only the leaf, whatever is the no number of nodes at the leaf level, that is actually same, actually one less, or I can as, as of now just think it is same, equal to the all the nodes in the internal level, right? So if that is yeah. the case, that's why I can do size by two in order to leach the internal nodes. Getting the point why this size by two is taking me to the internal nodes. Because 
since it, it is equal to, and that's why we are doing actually the minus one because it is one less. So size by two is taking care of this fact that since it is an almost complete binary tree. Now, if he would not have been an almost complete binary tree, you could not have used this size by two minus one in order to reach the first internal node. Since it is following the binary tree's complete property, that's why you can actually argue that size by two minus one is by first internal node. Fine. Yes. Okay. So now I type from size by two minus one i, and I go to let's say the. For, yeah, this, this, sir, can uh, we open a terminal and start coding in there? It means like uh, that. That's not my job, man. So that's your <laughs> job. You, I, I should not even discuss this much pseudo code. So okay. I should I write the theoretical part. But anyways, still I am discussing. Sir, sir, this 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 line I will repeat. The size by two minus one. How it is coming? Just apply and check now that I, I what I want to do is find the first parent node. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It is coming. It is coming. But how it is coming is so the main factor is since in an almost complete binary tree the number of leaf nodes is equal to the number of the internal nodes. I mean not one less. As of now, just no. think it is equal. Just think it is equal. Okay. So okay, so, okay. So if it is equal, if I divide the total, what is the total size? Total size would be this whole thing. Yes. Sir. Yeah. Now, yeah. If, if I say this is equal to this. So this is also x and this is also x. So x yeah. plus x equal to this whole thing that is size. Yes. Yeah, right? Uh, so what okay. does that mean? If I divide the, if I half it, so 2x equal to size. So by 2 equal to x. So x equal to size okay. by 2. Okay. Right? So what is x? x is the number of internal node and also equal to the leaf node, but it is anyway the internal node. So that's why I'm getting the first internal node, right? Yes. OK. So anyways. So for i equal to size by 2 minus 1 to 0, I am going. And uh, anything else? Am I missing anything over here? Oh, by the way, size would be decreased. So every time I'm not putting in range function. So basically, your size would be i would be minus minus in that respect. Every time I'm updating i by one, by one less, I mean decreasing it by one. So that's done. Okay. Now, what what I should do? Next thing. That's mm -hmm. it. All done. No, almost. Sir, condition condition is also required now. Sir, so there is one Follow. more thing. If we call the heap five for four and he call the heap five for three, then the result is same. Okay, I would come to that just a second. So ARR of i, that's what I have to do. That's it. Okay. Check, check. What is happening? What will so, be sir, the first? Yeah. So it will happen for this one. It will work for this. But then, sir, say for example, there are more. Of more nodes on top of this tree, then sir, it wouldn't work because then sir, it will on, on always take the the second last layer, heapify it, and then it won't go more on top. No, then it will stop. because i is going till zero, na. That so, is it. Yeah. So it will first okay. check hundred, then nine, yes, yes, yes. then it will okay. check ten. In okay, that okay. Yeah, six. Got it. Got it. Got it. Got it. That's why we are going till zero, till the start node over here, till 10. OK? OK. So that's why I at first did not discuss the build heap. We at, did the heapify algorithm to make it into a heap. Then we saw, OK, we, we are running into this trouble that, OK, this part got become a heap after the swapping. But the lower part is not guaranteed to be heap. So OK, rather apply the heapify from the bottom to top. So that's what build heap is doing. But that's it. This is build heap. Finished. Right. So from okay. the first parent node, I mean, from the back side, the first parent node, you are starting to apply heapify and then you apply on 100, you apply on 9 and then on 10. So every node you would apply by minus, minus, minus 1. Right. Okay. okay. So now let us come back. So let us apply. So heapify algorithm on 100. Let us now start writing the heapify algorithm. Uh, this is 10. First thing is heapify on 100. And this was my heapify algorithm. So I apply heapify on 100. What would I do? Left uh, child 
so in that case you have to take care of when you find this index of smallest basically you have to take care of okay let me write that only so we put that in try and accept what, what, yeah, yes what, how, how you applied this hp5 just previously it was 171 81 you have the index right this r is the index and index. If, yeah yeah just listen if 81 wouldn't have been a child right so what would be there in sixth index nothing because it's out of the size what would be the size in that case size would be 6 so your last index would be 5 in that case if 81 wouldn't have been there size would be 6 and your last index would be 5 yes sir now you calculated 71 left child and right child in these two lines right yes so 71 left child and right child would be what 71 uh, l would be you would get 5 and uh, so what is the parent here what is the parent here 2 Yeah, yeah, L and size should be strictly greater than R, and with that you have to. I am not writing the whole code here. You have to put the if this smallest condition, which one is smallest. So is size greater than L required? Because we not will, in this case. Again, we in, definitely have an L. Uh, in this case, it is not required. But what happens? Okay, should I tell that? See, <laughs> the thing is, actually, that is the only part. That's why I wrote in this bracket format. So, because in a situation where only left child is there, so consider this case, right? Yes, sir. So here you are checking for this note. Oh, sorry, consider this case. So, if you come to this particular note, sometimes. right sometime in the in the iteration you come to this node so then you have you, have, you would get lnr but lnr would be out of bound okay correct yes yeah, yeah. sir so, so those entry cases you should find out otherwise there is no difference between writing pseudo code and code so anyways it's very simple basically you have to put this this line is the only line that i have not write, written here you have to write basically two if statements would be there one would be checking for left child another would be checking for right child with the largest i mean smallest or largest whatever you want to find so with the boundary conditions and all anyways 
so if you have doubt you can put it on discourse if you don't uh, i mean understand how to do it i would give the code only uh, mm -hmm. so anyways so let's start it so we came to 9 next thing 9 is anyway we don't have to do anything then we go for 10 right and with 10 we do the same thing as we discussed in place of 10 we would write 9 for 9 you will not require because 19 no. should be on the left no 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 in sibling we don't oh, have anything no. right yeah. yeah 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 okay okay only 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 here it is not the condition right so now my heap has been formed right yes so that's it then but there is a difference that, i mean that could not come up in this example but let us take an example let us modify it a little bit somehow uh, let's see if i this is actually not happening because if i would have one more level then it would happen so if i swap that thing it is Uh, okay, so 71 and 7, right? Let us consider this 7. Let us consider this 9. Let us consider this 10. Oh, then also it would not happen. So what situation are we looking for? Uh, just a second. The thing is, see, there is a. If I do this swapping, now, let's say, actually, so I would, think what you were trying to do, if you make it, five no. eight, then it it would have five eight. Where you are telling? I think what you are trying to say is like if we move uh, ten to seven's place, but um, some some value, the child of seven uh, seven is actually. Smaller than ten. Exactly, but that uh, I need to have one more. Yeah, yeah. So, so you can make five the fifth element as eight. Yeah. Uh, wait. Uh, if I do that, then correct, then correct, 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 correct. Yeah. Correct. If I do that eight, then also it is holding the heap lower level. But if I move nine over uh, swap ten, yeah, correct. Thanks. Yeah. Nice. So now, yeah. So now take this example. So initially everything would be uh, same, 7, 8 and 81 would remain same, right? Uh, everything, this is a heap, we applied that, suppose everything is done, 9, 70, 19 is a heap. And now I am applying this heap property on the 10th one, 10th index, last iteration, 0th index. So I find that which one is the smallest, now I get 7. Okay, so 7 is the smallest, so I would change 10 with 7. 10 comes here, 7 comes here. Done. But now, is it a heap? See. No, sir. No, sir. It's not a heap, right? Because initially it was heap and 7 was there. Then it was a heap. Now 10 went and 10 was there. But this upper level wasn't a heap. 10th level was not a heap. But the lower levels were heap. But because of this swapping at the upper level, now my lower level's property has been lost, heap property. And that is not accounted for in this code. Because it is working till swap only. I did the swap with 7, seven and 10. Now what should I do then? So you should call heapify again for index of smallest. Exactly. So yeah, once after you make a if you make a swap. If I if I make a swap, uh, swap. So in that case, what I would do is since I have swapped, so there is a possibility that my lower level tree might get disturbed. Lower level heap property might get disturbed. Now, in the previous example that I discussed, it did not get disturbed. But in this example, as one of, I don't know who, who, who did that suggestion, actually. Uh, can you uh, tell your name? Who is it? Wait. Archit. Archit. Yeah, thanks, Archit. So, for that suggestion. So, as Archit said that if I make the value 8 the from here, 100 to 8. So I would get this property that after doing the swap, still the heap property is getting lost. 
so there can be some cases when the after doing the swap the lower level heat property might get disturbed so that's why what we would do to be in the safe side inside the if condition whenever i am doing a swap i would call the hipi file again recursively yeah keep on hipi file unless altered hipi file is not uh, uh, satisfying the condition yeah. once so, i don't yeah, know right yeah exactly so since i did it i mean i made the exchange i made the swap and because of the swap my property of heap has been lost so i have to take care of the swap position as the parent and pass it as the parent in heapify so that the everything below it is taken care of so i would call heapify on error comma which one to the swap index right so i would pass it on the ifs index of that sir but what if there was one more heap below it and that would not be have been a like after changing that would have been disturbed no then problem we... recurs again recursion would take care once i have put recursion take here it. it would go on doing take that it. until it satisfies as uh, uh, yeah un until it says the, the, the recursive condition will be satisfied then it will be stopped right yeah exactly right mm. okay. so that once i put the recursion let's say you say there is some other heap over here that is not getting so that is getting disturbed fine no problem this hipi file is corresponding to this level right now this hipi file is the recursive code so i would come to this code again so i would execute all these lines and i would again get another hipi file so this hipi file would then take care of this one the next do while do do while condition like that do while like conditional right uh, yeah looping you yeah. you can yeah basically any loop you can implement it in the form of recursion okay. right so that's what okay, you are doing okay. that's what okay. you are doing so so once i put the recursion to be safe side now then the question is what is the running time of this code which is the last discussion of today so my heaps are made so what is the running time of this code heap what is the running time of this it is very easy see it is size by minus 1 by 2 to 0 you are going so this would take your order of n by 2 C considering n is the size so n by 2 that is basically order of n mm. is it correct or did yes. i do something wrong No, correct. Mm -hmm. No, sir. Nothing wrong. So once, again, once again, once again, once again. Sir, but the heapify is being called recursion. <laughs> exactly. Once again, once again. Order of n into whatever time heapify is taking into order of n. It is looking like that. Is it or not? Yes, sir. Yes. Fine. Yes. Sir. As yeah. of now, let's take it at that. So at first, now come to heapify algorithm. How much time heapify would take? All of this is constant time. This is also constant time. This is also constant time. right yes so only hipify is doing recursion that's the time that hipify is taking fine yes sir yes, so sir. obviously hipify uh, how hipify is working it is working recursively on the whole height of the tree right so basically it is uh, checking let's say 10 with respect to 10 it is checking 8 and 81 and when it it was at at this level it checked eight, this node with this node and since the property of heap property got lost then again recursively this node was checking for these two nodes and order again, of n uh, yes, order of log log order of log n exactly log n because we are do, do, doing it till the height in the proportion of height yeah. so heapify is order of log n which is basic actually i should write order of height which is basically order of log n fine so yes. so that means build heap would take order of n n log n into n log n so it is n log n yes right. satisfied sir yes sir okay so put that in a dustbin because it is order of n <laughs> why amortized analysis again so that we will not discuss today uh, build it would take order n time it's not order n log n time because of the amortized analysis the hint i would give why amortized analysis again same thing you are taking order n into log n and saying it is taking order n log n time log n is fine but are the initial stages of heapify taking log n time when you are applying no. heapify on this it was taking only this much time only again you are applying this much time but when you go towards the top then you might have to do it for the whole level right yes yes so towards the end of application of heapify when you have reached towards the top then it would be near to order log n but in the initial stages it would be very less hipify algorithm 
same thing happened in that uh, our uh, find uh, sorry union method that in the initial stages it was taking less time because the component sizes were small towards the end the component size was large and that's why it was taking more time so that's why even in hipify also you have to apply amortized analysis to get the proper Correct. sir but how do we determine here we will apply amortized and here we will apply asm total did you understand that why hipify would not take initially less i mean no more time because obviously yes, the sir. it is at the bottom then it doesn't go more bottom so yeah and at more. the later stages it would take more time because you are to reach the top and you might need to come down by recursion if you disturb the hip property that's why yes. at later stages it would take more time so any if you have if you relate it with our union operation union operation was also taking less time in the start and at the end it was taking more time right because yes. at the end your component size was more any operation where the where it is such that the same operation is taking lesser time at the start and as it reaches towards the end it is taking more time or it is taking more time at the start and at is as it reaches towards the end of the algorithm it takes lesser time any such kind of operation where the execution of the same operation is not same time taking throughout the course of the action in hmm. those kind of cases you have to apply amortized analysis because okay. that's that's what it makes sense right if you have same amount of time of execution you can take a constant part but if the execution time varies then the best thing is take all the time divided by the number of time you are calling that's the average time that's the thing that we do okay right so, so then, is, why, yeah why for example we don't use amortized for like insertion sort okay insertion like, sort uh, how much time it would take consider we take it o n square but like uh, the 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 sorted part is increasing so like first time we just have to compare it to one element then okay. the second time just two elements okay so, but uh, little difference is hp here you are not applying insertion sort multiple times but here you are applying hipify algorithm the whole algorithm it's a multiple times get that idea hipify find uh, sorry not find uh, union and hipify these two are separate algorithms not part of the algorithm it's not part of the array that is getting increased or decreased it's the whole algorithm that is taking separate time different amount of time insertion sort is the whole algorithm that we are talking about Insert, once insertion sort is done it is done we are not applying it multiple times if we apply multiple time that means we are applying on different arrays if you want to separate out a part of insertion sort into a separate function and then tell that okay this function is the code that is taking separate amount of time at multiple execution that you can do can you segregate any part of insertion sort like that that's my question um you can just have the insert function, function that that inserts within a list yeah so that it's we can point. say that this insert is like you know we are running through the whole thing and then inserting that element so we can call that as a function and then we can say okay this one is being called again and again no for that, each element that is the, again a loop see the thing is that is again a loop on the same data set you are working but when you are working on hipify or uh, that union it's not the same data set because every time you call hipify you call it with a different parent different i mean different at in building sorry in your uh, what was the name union also it was a separate component now the thing is in insertion it, it's a subtle to observe this thing because there you are trying to separate out the array and put it in a loop and then consider that okay the array segment is increasing the point is not that the point is that the whole algorithm will remain as it is i would apply the algorithm multiple time as a whole insertion sort quick sort selection sort any of those sort it's not that we are applying the whole algorithm multiple times in a, in the course of the action right i mean okay. uh, uh, so what i'm trying to say is maybe you can use insertion sort in some other code in order to achieve something and there you have to argue that whether i can use insertion sort to do amortized analysis or not unless and until you use the whole insertion sort as a utility to achieve something then you cannot come into this uh, argument that insertion sort itself is amortized and this is can we do or not the idea is you have an algorithm you apply the algorithm multiple times since it is taking different amount of times now i would tell you that hipify itself we also told log n right now you would say see i am telling this you would say hipify we discuss it is taking log n but 
if i apply hp5 on this three element then it is obviously not taking log n it would take much less at time so why should i tell that order of log n is the complexity of hp5 complexity yeah. of complexity of this is similar to your insertion sort argument that your initially insertion sort the sorted part is less and then it is increasing so why i cannot apply amortized analysis so that amortized analysis i can i can also say for hp5 okay at first before saying that let me tell this hp5 is not amortized analysis hp5 is log n only build deep is amortized analysis okay 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 build deep is amortized analysis hp5 is normal right okay. got it uh if 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 is log n only okay uh, again see see the uh, analogy here hp5 is uh, uh, order log n that because it's uh, because it's a whole algorithm and i cannot go inside that algorithm and claim that on a smaller data set or a larger data set the idea of amortized analysis comes into play when you are given a module a mo given an algorithm you are applying that whole algorithm multiple times and it is giving different taking different time different uh, times right different amount okay. of time it is taking different times so when can you get different amount of times when you are it can only get that when you are applying the algorithm multiple times so i am applying the hp5 algorithm multiple times inside build deep method and that's why amortized analysis is done for heap build deep method not for hp5 method so that's what okay. i was trying to say if you can consider another larger algorithm i mean some problem in which you are using insertion sort as an utility function and then you have to argue that as a part of this whole bigger problem solving i am using insertion sort let's say a number of times and the initial time the first second third time i applied insertion sort it is taking less time and towards the end k times it is taking k k minus 1 iteration it is, not iteration k k minus 1 th calling of the insertion sort is it is taking more time if you can argue that then you can say it is amortized analysis but you cannot argue that because insertion sort would take i mean similar amount of time it's not like that so it depend on the array size but obviously cons considering the array size remains same it would take similar time so okay. on, only okay. those got the point right so that's the difference fine so analysis of this uh, actually this uh, just as of now please remember the build deep operation is order n and hp5 is order log n keep these two things in mind order log n is very simple normal amortized uh, normal analysis build deep is order n and uh, just keep this thing in mind it is order n proof is not there in the syllabus and uh, but still we would try to discuss uh, in the next class okay so but before okay. discussing the order n of build heap we would discuss the other methods of heap so this is what we have done till now representation of heap is done and now we have done how to make a heap using build heap and min heap, uh, heapify algorithm so heap has now we have only gained the data structure now we would learn the utility part of the data structure in the next part which is my extract main method because that's what our motive was right this is only setting up setting up part we learned that how to set up the heap now we would learn a method called extract mean which would actually uh, and insert because that's was the next thing insert so and delete also delete is extract mean only because deleting from the heap doesn't make any sense extract means when you are put taking the minimum element and putting it away right? okay so sir in the middle of the the heap we will not never take out elements no because it's a priority queue no yeah it's a priority queue the main okay. motive of priority queue was you want the minimum or the maximum element and you want to do the insertion in log i mean lesser time lesser than n time okay. that's that's the main intent so this is your uh, fetch priority element part and this is your insertion less than order n part so these are the two features of my priority queue okay so what and, what in, in the whole process what what is this uh, priority queue in this uh, binary tree almost binary tree what is the priority queue heap is the priority queue the bi almost binary tree uh, almost binary tree is the structural definition of heap now heap is itself the priority queue okay okay the whole heap is a priority queue in which 
we are we are finding the priority element yeah yeah yeah, yeah. That, the main thing of priority keys is these two condition that i told that fetching of element on the basis of priority that priority can be minimum or maximum second is insertion in less than n time these these two properties satisfy you call anything a priority queue heap is a particular implementation of priority queue whose structural property is it's it's a almost complete binary tree and logical property is parent is lesser than child the priority element which one will be the priority element nine minimum element minimum element yeah okay yeah to find the minimum element is the priority queue right yeah, yeah, okay yeah, okay. yeah, yeah. min heap minimum element is the lowest i mean priority max heap maximum element is the priority okay max max heap will be like that okay okay the same okay. process okay so Thank till you. now yeah so till now we have learned this heap representation and after in the next class we have to learn these two methods right okay yeah acha i would yeah. uh, anyway need to discuss the theoretical part otherwise i cannot do the coding along i mean pseudo code discussion but i would still request you guys to at least watch the theoretical part of extract min and insert uh, from the lectures okay it would be faster that way so okay, yeah. okay. We, will, we, we will we will go through that before that yeah okay. yeah because the coding part uh, i would discuss it's not there so other things you so tomorrow please. you will to take tomorrow this one continue tomorrow because tomorrow is also no. the session na day no. after tomorrow tomorrow i will not take tomorrow session is there for that programming assignment for the coding for the yeah programming assignment right you will take the next class okay then we will do it tomorrow okay now okay yeah. fine next sir uh, uh, next class or friday or what i don't know we have to discuss i would inform but the class okay. will be taken that's for sure so so programming okay. assignment like uh, live coding no yeah. the tuesday also you guys do na practice programming assignment that thing okay 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 I think uh, Harish Harish takes that class, right? Harish is the team. We yes, have, uh, yeah. So Harish would take that class. Also, sir, when is the uh, online proctored exam? Ah, the date I forgot. Uh, I think it has been communicated to you guys, right? On twelfth. On twelfth. On twelfth. Proctored right. exam is on twelfth. Oh, proctored exam is on twelfth. Yeah, very close. But not for this course, I think. Uh, in PDS, it is not. The no. PDS a proctor exam we do not have. But the thing is, uh, okay, you are asking for PDS. Okay, PDS a uh, no proctor exam is there. No oh. proctor exam. Proctor exam is only for other courses, Java or like that. Yeah. On twelfth, on the Java. Yeah. Java DBMS, all those courses are proctor exam. But uh, no. okay. Any one of you taking Java or DBMS? Sir, DBMS I have taken. App Dev yeah. also I have taken. I I have to, I have taken Java. This term, right? Yeah, this time so so I am totally confused because the whole, both things are too difficult to manage. So now I leave this PDS. I will concentrate on Java. Okay, okay. I've taken all the PDS and DBMS all together. Java PDS and DBMS? No, no. Uh, after PDS and DBMS and one internship at IIT. Awesome. So <laughs> and offline college also. Okay. Then... We are BSc man. No, we are not getting time because we are. we have to manage the office also so we, it is very difficult to manage these two courses but uh, still we are doing we are repeating this time okay yeah do it sir could i make a request so nice yeah arshit <laughs> sir like yesterday we had the deadline for week 5 and day after tomorrow we have a deadline for week 6 yeah. while for week 7 we have <laughs> time till 19th of march so very difficult very difficult would it be possible just by one or two days it would it would like ease week, the process week 6 right yes sir okay uh like the deadline for this week 6 assignment is very close yes okay. sir okay week 6 uh, graded assignment are you talking about right or the graded programming yeah. or the normal graded assignment all the graded Both part are, all, all graded part are on it sir all the graded parts are connected with each other we cannot do Oh, in isolation oh, okay okay yeah yeah, yeah. so so what happened what happened the lot of portal was not working and we have to do on the sunday yes, so sir. one day also left and now we are getting only one or two days in it fact, is very difficult what we are doing otherwise leave it in fact because <laughs> it was shut down we had to do week 5 on over the weekend only week 5 assignments yes sir and we we could not get any time for week 6 content uh, like week 5 i was only able to do the the two algorithms the first two algorithms bellman ford i was not able to understand so i left the bellman ford part okay. sir at least at least for the week 6 eh? see assignment date to be extended two or one or two days it would be 
much easier okay, okay. i i understand i under, i am starting with heap how how can you guys i mean i can expect how can i tell that you expect you to write the code and everything by two days so that i understand but the not thing possible, is sir, not possible at all i understand but the thing is uh, i cannot give you the guarantee that i would be able to pursue that i can i would talk if possible that yeah. would be done if you okay. could please communicate it with the yes, I, communication i would do communication i, I tell you do. what happened sir what happened sir the when the course started the portal was not properly working and the uh, uploading of the course was late and this was managed with a fixed date because they could not change the fixed date because a number of things were aligned with that so they are not but at least they can do extension of the assignment this is this can be managed because, because sir, we will do we will do. because of a week 7 it's like 19 then we have like whole 11 days even if we could yeah. like one two day it would be much better oh. at least after 12 sir after oppp exam we should get two days 